We're sharing some brotherly love, coder to coder this week, when fellow powder coder BJ Putvane and his wife Lydia from Green Mountain Powder Coating join the show. We turn the mic over to them as they interview Ross Coat. We'll be taking a deeper dive to discover specific topics on all things powder coating, like hot flocking, gun settings, managing your business, teamwork, and so much more. If you've listened to episode three, Hidden Secrets to Hot Flocking, this is a continued discussion from the original episode. Let's get ready to level up your powder coder game. Today's special guest interviewer is BJ Putvain from Green Mountain Blasting and Powder Coating. Um, he has a YouTube channel by the same name uh, where he covers powder coating uh, topics and tips. He'll also be asking Ross about uh, the coating business uh, and some maybe some personal questions as well. So BJ and Lydia, his lovely wife, Welcome to the show. Thank you for having us. Thank you. You're welcome. It is a bit chilly over there. In now, your guys are from Vermont, right? Yes, right up by the Canadian border. Yep. Wow. Okay. So first off, is tell us a little bit about yourselves. Uh, I did mention your YouTube channel, but where else can people find you online? Uh, we have a website, uh, GM Powder Coating. Um, at ya, no, whoops, dot, dot com. com. Sorry about that. Uh, we also have a Facebook uh, page under our company name, Green Mountain Media Blasting and Powder Coating, and our YouTube channel, of course. How long have you guys um, been powder coating? We have started together. Um, I've done it in the past. Uh, we got married. Uh, we just bought a house a couple of years ago, and since we had a shop attached to it. Uh, we decided to try just setting it up for a little bit of extra money, uh, not realizing what actually turned into. Um, <laughs> so we ended up getting getting everything. I, I have jo a job. She has a job. Uh, we do powder coating when we get home at night. Uh, until oh, we actually get home. And we're a few weeks out, if not months, on jobs here. Uh, it just took off surprisingly. Wow. So yeah. I, I know that one of the questions we're going to be talking about is that transition um, to full time. Uh, so but really, let's get down to those nitty gritty questions right away, because I know a lot of listeners want to know more about that original episode that we talked about. Of course, back then we weren't doing video. We were just uh, talking and, and making it an MP3. So now we're up to video and we do have video to show the listeners too. So, um, but I think we should start with your questions first and then yeah. Ross will cue me in um, when he's ready to show what he did. And he actually did his rims this week. <laughs> Ironically, the timing could have been more perfect. So Ross, uh, thanks for finally joining us. You've built out the shop. <laughs> You've got a little bit of free time um, uh, to join us and start working more on the podcast and, and hosting and stuff. So thanks for coming today. And I appreciate you very much, my my dear husband. Yes, yes. Welcome. Welcome. Everybody, welcome. So go ahead, BJ. I'm going to give you the stage. Go ahead. Take it away. Okay. Uh, to start with, so I watched your episode three up here in northern Vermont. Uh, 90 percent of my rims that I do are rust uh, just because of our winners. Uh, we barely ever, I don't even think this year, we took in one good set of rims just to color match or anything like that. It's all been garbage rims. Um, hot blocking has always been a taboo uh, as I were, have been coming up through. And when I watched your guys' episode, um, and you guys were talking about like uh, building up rims um, with powder, you know, to fill voids. Um, 
or basically doing lug holes. I know when I'm doing rims, one of the hardest part is the lug holes. Um, so just like a light clicked off in my head. I'm like, wait, you know, if he's doing this and then doing the rest of the rims the regular way, um, I, I like that idea. Yes. Um, and when he was talking about how to hang it and stuff, and that's where I was like, okay, I'm not quite understanding that. I know a few of subscribers I've talked to about it, and I have some questions for them too as we go along also. Um, so I guess that's pretty much where we're at is that hot block in uh, topic. All right, well, uh, definitely hot blocking, the holy grail. This video that we're gonna show you will make it very easy for you to conduct your business. In fact, once you learn this method, you're not gonna go back to doing it the way you were doing it. This is what, it was like an aha moment for me. I, one day, I actually, it was a mistake. And I, I, when I was redoing it, I did it this way. And I was like, the light went on, boing, you know, hey, why don't we just do them all like this? And it'll be much easier. Um, so I think the best way for us to do this is just go ahead and queue up the video, Kim. And we're just gonna go ahead and run through this. Now you asked us about the process and how we do everything. So uh, first of all, all the rims are basically stripped if they're previously powder coated or if they're painted. If they're chromed, they just go straight to sandblast. Now, I usually don't take bad chrome projects, but we do from time to time. Uh, that said, with the uh, uh, powder coated and painted rims, I put them into a stripper vat of Benco. Give a little shout out to my friends over there. B17, that stuff is fantastic. It will cut your costs down and time down specifically for doing this project. We put them in the, uh, the vat for about 15, 20 minutes, pull them out, basically rinse them off. And then from there, we go straight to uh, sandblasting. The sandblasting is uh, basically 80 mesh garnet. That's what I use, but you can use any media. I just find that the garnet's the best. It's the cheapest that I can get to Hawaii. And uh, I have really good results with it. I can use it up to about eight times before I throw it out. <clears throat> that said, we go from there to the rinse. And I think that's where our video starts, right, Kim, with the video? It does. Okay, now before, before we get going, these are aluminum rims. These are my personal rims. And uh, basically what I am doing here is I have blew them off. I blew them off before we rinse them with air, compressed air. And what I'm doing now is I'm rinsing them with an acid mixture of water. Now this mixture is, uh, I, you can hey, go to any heart, you can go I'm, to any heart. Oh, what are you doing? Let me start the video. Oh, okay, go ahead. Can you see the video? Yep. Okay. Okay, so we're just basically using a Johnson sprayer here. And what I'm doing is, well, first of all, the mixture is uh, OSPO, one part, and it's three parts water, just basically tap water. And you can see in my container there, it's a little bit of an off green. It should have like a mild green look. Now you can buy this stuff at Ace, Home Depot. Uh, it's also known as a concrete cleaner. So you can use that stuff too. Uh, it's just a really mild acid and it, it will get any of the dirt or grease that you didn't get off, off the rims. Uh, but you can't let it sit for too long. Uh, well, so you'll see that I go through all the rims, go from the back side, front side to the back side, and of course to the to the barrel and do the whole thing. And then I'm going to rinse it right here. I'm rinsing it with water, and of course I'm touching it. Make sure your hands you don't eat fried chicken before you do that, and <laughs> rinse them off. <laughs> Give them a good rinsing, because that acid, if you leave it on will create problems in your finish. It'll look like little microscopic bubbles uh, if you're just doing a single stage. So uh, very important that you rinse them very good. We're giving them a good rinse. I go back, front, back, inside. Just make sure you get all the particles. Uh, sometimes like in the lug nut holes, you'll get like uh, media still in there. So you gotta make sure that's all out. So, okay, now we let them, I let them dry out in the sun. And now what I'm doing is I'm air blasting everything out. All those little holes, anything, the lug nuts, anything, we want to blast it, make sure there's no water left over. There's basically no sand. 
we get that all out. This is real important because if you don't get the stuff out, the little particles, and you have one piece of grain of sand, that's gonna show up in your finish. So I basically blow this off, go through all the rims. So it's a B17, then you're sanding, then you're doing nest up as your pre-prep. Yes, and then I go to taping, and however you tape, you know, do it your way. Um, I use the green tape for, uh, you know, this type of job, uh, which is two layers. If I start doing multiple coats, like uh, uh, more than three, uh, I will use the uh, fiberglass tape because it will, I've had this tape actually fall off into my rim job once you get multiple layers on it. Uh, but for doing two layers, I just use the green tape. Uh, this, this, you can see this pattern is a pain in the ass. You gotta get in there. I use basically a razor blade and I just cut it out and work my way around. Some guys cut out the center, I don't. I just leave it all in there. Uh, it, it's really up to you. And that's what I put on there, black label. That stuff was amazing. Uh, this is my gun. So we have a Wagner Sprint. And basically, I always use the Faraday cage mode. That's basically hard recess button to get on the machine there. It's the third one down. I don't know what kind of machine you're using, but if you have a Faraday cage mode, that's the mode you want to put it on. And basically your KV is set at 70. Okay. Your microamps, I believe I have 40. And let's see what I'm, I can't remember what I'm saying here. <laughs> air in your what was your air in your powder at? Uh, well, the air, as far as, uh, uh, what like the PSI coming in or, yeah, or like mine has air, uh, air and the powder, the percentage, um, just because if you're blowing into the holes, you're probably not going to want major air going into it. Correct. That is correct. So, uh, basically the, on my standard setup, it's at 50%. The air is, so I bring it down and I bring it down. This is what I'm talking about right now. If you can do it on your gun, you can do that, or you just go to the board. I usually keep it for hot flocking. I usually keep it in between anywhere between 33 to 37%. So that basically, you know, means 37% of 100%. That's what that dial means. And nobody powder coats at 100%. Uh, generally speaking, you know, uh, uh, you know, if you're doing a big piece, you're gonna be at 60, maybe 70%. But uh, let me, let me go ask ahead. You. Your air you're putting at 50%, uh, what are you coming into the machine at to put at 50%? Because of course okay. it's different from 30 to 50. Right, okay, so uh, basically I have my air pressure set at 80 PSI coming in to my machine. And that's basically what I've been told is where you want it. Uh, the manual says anywhere between 180 to 100 PSI. I, I think 80 PSI is a nice uh, number. It's not hard on the machine. Uh, and there you have it. Uh, there is some other air function nodules uh, here in, um, in the center. And that's a little more complex when you get into there. But if, you're just, if your machine just basically allows you to, to uh, adjust your kilovolts and your um, uh, microamps and the air pressure, basically that's where you want it. Real simple. So, but this also, because I'm using a, a, a nozzle, not a fan nozzle, not a, a, a cone nozzle, uh, there's different settings and different applications for that too within this machine that you can set up. Now, this is very important here in the video, uh, a fluidizer. I don't know if you guys use fluidizers. Good, yeah. all right. Uh, you know, a lot of guys that use box feeds, um, that's great for using like rowels, but once you start doing any type of candy, any type of metallic, you have to use a fluidizer. It's that simple. It will also save you a lot of money because you don't have product going all over the floor. Um, and it's just a lot easier to contain. I, you know, it's funny is I, I don't really use the big, I have a big uh, 10 gallon, uh, excuse me, uh, five gallon and uh, excuse me, five pound and uh, 20 pound fluidizer. And I hardly ever use those. I always use this little guy. It's pretty amazing. So uh, it, it's really nice. You can, you know, I basically for uh, 120 inch rim will take basically one fill of this and uh, uh, you can see I got it three quarters fill. And this is real important. You would want to get your, uh, your, your fluidization here. 
to look like it's bubbling. A lot of guys that get too much or not enough, but you want to look at it and it wants to look like water almost like it's moving around in there and you'll see the bubbles coming up and you can tell because if you grab the actual fluidizer, it will actually move on you and spill out really easily. Yeah, I was actually. It spills out here. <laughs> Whoops, there we go. <laughs> so I have a couple of questions on the fluidizer. Okay, so some of these machines that we're getting nowadays, and this has been a question to me uh, and in other videos, um, some of these fluidizers don't have that exhaust on the top. Um, they come just with your bottom and your top ones. Do you feel that you need the exhaust on a fluidizer or if it comes without it, then it's pretty much leave it alone? Uh, it's just, it's, if you fill it up correctly, uh, like how I just didn't do in this video, uh, I put too much in and that's why it spills out. It comes out of the top of the vent there. You don't need it. So that's why they have, you just got to make sure that you're filling it up. I would say three quarters of the way up, you know, you don't go any farther than that because then that happens. And, you know, like I, I didn't, you know, but uh, anyways, <laughs> I was in a rush doing my, when I, it's funny, whenever I do my own stuff, I never stick to the rules. <laughs> yeah. Cause there's a lot, there's a lot of fluidizer issues going on. Like uh, for example, with my machine, uh, first time I used it. it Here, Kim, pause, 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 Kim. Kim, pause. Okay, what was that? Yeah. You, you have uh, the so fluidizer? My, yeah, I got a fluidizer. First time I used it, it ended up blowing all the, the powder out, three quarters of the whole tube. Um, and I was told basically we need to, should have an exhaust in it. Um, and that will relieve the pressure and that will make it to where it runs better and won't surge. So that's basically why I was asking about that. Also, okay. what do you use when your fluidizer at? I mean, high, low, or just whatever it does until it goes to a boil? Until it goes to a boil. So basically turn your air off completely. And each powder is a little different. Some of the metallics will boil real quickly. Uh, some of the other ones, like the bronzes, they're a little more heavier set and you have to have a little more air. So very important that you just put your powder into your fluidizer, uh, maybe start, you know, with less, uh, maybe like a half a fill and then bring your air up and then wait for it to start the, the, the bubbles to boil up. And once that happens, you should be at the right air percentage right there with that. Now, if you go too high and it starts flowing out, yeah, that's, that's a big problem. Uh, now, I've, I've never had a, a non-vent on mine. All mine are all vented, every single one of them. So uh, that probably could be an issue. So, uh, you know, I've never thought of that. So, but it, it wouldn't, uh, I don't think would cause a problem if you, if you didn't have the powder in so high. So, you know, just make sure you're not putting that much powder in. And it's very important not to put too much powder in when you're using the fluidizer because it actually, if you put too much in there, it's just, it's not doing its job. It's just basically all jumbled up inside that uh, canister. So you wanna have enough breathing room inside of it to make it fluidize. And a really good way, like I said, that you know you have proper fluidization is when you you can actually grab the canister with the with the top off and just lightly go like this and it will look like water. It will, it will look and act like water. You know you're at the right level of air. So that's pretty much it. Perfect. So uh, we're here with the video. So uh, this, uh, we're gonna start hot flocking. This rim just came out of the oven. It is very hot. We had it at uh, uh, 385 for about, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes. So I basically like to outgas the rims make sure we don't have any bubbling or anything like that. So we basically get them up to temperature, let them run for about 15, 20 minutes, and then we come in here. Now, this is the key. You see how I'm working in small circular patterns. And there, you don't even see a powder cloud, really. There is, and this is the key. You don't want too much powder because if you have your powder cloud too high, and that's why I'm saying you want your air at about 37, that's where I usually have it at. And I just basically work 
work it. Now, is this in real time, Kim? What? Yeah. What do you mean real time? Is that is that real speed right there? Yes. Oh, okay. So it might be a little fast in terms of conversion for you know. Does it seem a little fast? No, slow. it seems slow. <laughs> but uh, yeah, if it, it it takes about a minute to do a complete revolution. This is an 18 inch rim here, and you just got to take your time. You don't want to go fast. Uh, and you see, I only go one pass. It's very important. This is a key step, one pass. You don't do two passes, because if you do, you're going to have too much on that rim, and then you're going to have problems with drip, sag, that kind of problems. And we're going to basically get this whole rim in the back. We make sure you got it all covered. You can see I went in, got all the areas that are hard and recessed. Now I'm going to go around to the front. I always start from the rear of the rim, and then I go to the front. And this is the hard part. Now this rim, this was a mother bear because I got all, this is a hot flocker's dream right here. Cause look at the, the deep recesses everywhere. So this is where you want to do this. And you'll see, I'll start with the lug holes first. Uh, I must be talking about it, but uh, also I never just pull the trigger with the gun right up to the rim. I'm always outside. There you go. See, what, yeah. I, I, you don't just wanna pull the trigger when you're next to the rim, because you could have a burst of powder for some weird reason if you're standing on your, 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 your cords or whatever. So make sure you always pull your trigger outside of the rim and then come in and then start shooting it. Now, right here, you can see, once again, it, it, you're in close. And uh, this is where the, the milliamps or microamps are very important because you want to have those down. Uh, and it, so you don't have any issues with basically spider veining and, and static discharge. Of course, if you're, if you're hot coating, you don't have those problems because- well, ask, uh, with, yeah. hot block, with hot coating or hot blocking, do you have to, do you deal with back ionization with it? Or? Not, no, because that's the key. You're, 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 it's all hot and it's flowing out. As soon as this sucker hits the rim, it's flowing out. So uh, once again, I'm just basically working away the whole rim. I always start down at the bottom and then like in the six o'clock position, work myself up around noon in a clockwise position. And I always kind of like spin the, the, the gun in a circular clockwise position. Uh, it just depends on what you, how you like to shoot. I see a lot of guys like to go side to side. Uh, it's just whatever you're comfortable with. But I have found this is like coloring. It's just like coloring. And if you have ever uh, took a class in coloring, they tell you to work in circles. And this is basically what you're doing. You're filling in all the voids, all the areas. And you got to take your time and keep it at a low Air pressure, 37%. And one you like pass. the fan tip. Or uh, oh, yeah, yeah. You, once you use the fan tip, you'll you'll never go back to the other one. The conical just takes forever. <laughs> just take, it just takes a long time to get the powder on. So one pass. Uh, let's see here. What am I doing? You're going to do the barrel now. and Oh, okay. So, okay, so what I'm doing so now is I'm... Rough. I'm sorry, that I didn't hear you. Out. So where it yes. looks rough, that will smooth out in the cure process. Well, okay, we're not done here. So let's, okay. uh, we're gonna go to the uh, the barrel now. And sure. what I just did is I brought the air up because it takes a long time to, to do that at 37% with your air. So now what I'm gonna do is I brought it up to 50% and now it's gonna allow a bigger powder cloud and I'm gonna basically is that what I'm doing? I can't yeah. What I'm doing. All right. So the rim is cooling down. In all that time that I did this, the rim has cooled down. It is now at a point where it shouldn't flow out all the way. And what I'm going to do now is basically come in with the higher powder cloud now. And I'm not going to be in close like I was before, because this is where you can get back ionization. This is when you can also get the, the spider veins and all the beautiful things, the dimples and things that you want that you don't want to have in your, your finish. So you can see, I do come in a little close just to get into the inside here, but we want to stay a little, you can tell that I'm farther away as 
before. I'm, I'm literally about a foot away from the inside wall. So this is going on cooler, so it's more of a powder going on at this point. That's yes. Like from 37 on a powder up to basically normal, uh, like you would do on a cooler rim. Right, right. So the, I'm basically back to where I would be at, like doing a cooler rim. Uh, so for, you know what, I think it's still flowing out in this. Uh, we did another video. Uh, now, see, I've been doing this for so long, so I, I don't let it cool down all the time. I just, I just go straight into it because I know how much powder I need to put on there. But for somebody that's new learning this, you got to let the rim cool down a little bit because it's so easy to put too much on. And then if you put too much on, you just get this orange peely looking, you know, monstrosity. <laughs> uh, so uh, can we cut to the, the Tesla video? That's really what I need to, I, I, I just realized this, see it's flowing out still. Okay, so. you don't want to show people you're doing the barrel? No, let's go straight to the Tesla wheel. Cause you know what, this is, I, I just realized we have a, this is not, Really okay. good footage. The, what, but what's really cool about this is how the, uh, you can write that shot right there. You can see all those deep recessed areas that to get to uh, in the uh, in the rim. And it's just, you, there's only one way to do that. And that's the hot flocket. You, you, if you try to do that, if you try to do that uh, cold, you wouldn't get it in there. It, it just, it, you would have like, you'd have missed spots. And, and it's really easy to, even like in the corners, you'll think you got it and you look, you take your light and you look at it and, 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 and it's like, oh shit, you miss it. You know, it's that simple. And uh, when you do it that way, you don't miss it. It gets on there. And it's so one I was, time. So with the hot blocking, like I was thinking uh, when I watched your number three show uh, that you just did it for the lug holes. So you basically give it a base layer per se, a light base layer, then you basically come in and do like a cold powder. Correct, exactly, that's what I do. Oh. And I did a Tesla rim and I did it exactly like that because I, I, uh, I, I needed to make sure you guys understand. And when it's cold, it, it looks like a normal cold coat. It just goes on there. So what I do is I let, I'll hot flock the rim like you just saw. And then I basically go stand over in the corner and, you know, have a cigarette or, or you know, a beer break, or whatever you want to do, lunch break. It's not very long. It's only like about three to five minutes. And then that rim should be at about, I would say about 180 degrees, 200 degrees, somewhere in that range if you're using an infrared. Another way I do this, I do it by touch. I'll just put my hand right onto the back of the where the tape is at. And if I can hold it there for a moment, it's cool enough. If you can't hold your hand there and it's like, oh, that's hot, it's still too hot. And I actually, I do that method more than the infrared because I don't trust those damn things. Uh, you're better off just using your hand, just going back there and just going, okay, oh, that's too hot. And just come back in a minute later and just go, okay, that's perfect. I can keep my hand there for a moment. It's, not, it's hot, but it's not gonna burn my hand. And basically from there, you can start powdering like you normally would. But this is where you can get in trouble because you can get back ionization and all that stuff. So make sure you bring your settings and stay farther away from the rim. Very important to stay farther away from the rim and let the, let you, the powder cloud just kind of generally envelope the whole rim. And it's the same thing, one pass. Don't, do, don't get too crazy with it. Because yeah. if you put too much on, then it just looks, it doesn't look right. If you want that totally perfect gloss, glassy look, it's just a, a nice uniform, it's two thin coats is basically what I like to do. And that it's probably, if you did a mill thickness, it's probably about a, a, a mill and a half thick. It's it's not super thick, you know, but it's it, it lasts plenty of time. I've got jobs out there that I've done, you know, 15 years ago, they're still running around on the road looking new. Yeah, we have, so I have a couple of rims. I'm gonna try that because right now, what we show on our uh, YouTube channel and everything, is after you powder it, put it in, wait until flow out, take it out and look at it. Never put it through to the cure cycle because too many people put it through, it cures, they pull it out and there's voids or it's too light. So we always tell them, go in, let it flow out, take that time, pull it back out, look over it. Then if you see like it's light in spots, let it cool down and just give it a thin layer. So doing it your way, 
actually will save time in the long run because you're not doing that whole flow out time, cool down, letting it out or nothing. You're like hitting it, doing it all at once. You're doing two coats in one round. Mm -hmm. Yep, two different types. And there's really no way to get those light spots with that because when you do your flow out, you know you're hitting it because you're visually seeing those spots now. Right, that is correct. So it, it, this will save you time in the long run. It might be, you might, when you first do it, you go, oh my God, uh, this is taking, and also when you're first doing this, do just do it one rim at a time. Okay. Just, just. Uh, I mean, I don't know how big your oven is, so uh, I have two different ovens, so uh, I can I can take my time and do one run at a time in my small oven if I feel necessary, uh, or I can just rack them all up in the big oven. But if you do multiple rims, uh, you can get in trouble doing this that way because you're basically the other rims are cooling down as you're doing this. So you gotta you gotta keep so. Another way to do this, if you've got a bigger oven, is to bring one rim out at a time and, and do the it. And then, but, and then when they're covered, you can let them sit cold over in the corner and then put them all back on the rack and throw them back in the oven. So that's yeah, another we, way I, I do that, too. Yeah, we do two at a time. So, I mean, and we have two racks, so that would work out perfectly doing it that, that you know you're doing it the right way uh, a lot of these guys that got these big 20 foot oven. i mean i have a 20 foot oven but i don't do my rims in that sucker no way because you don't have much quality control uh with the bigger oven you got more air moving around in it and the littler oven actually will give you will give you better results you know so yeah stay with that method that's a good way to do that so let me ask you if you say you're spraying it and you're noticing you're getting a run or getting too thick. Is there any way to to fix that? <laughs> no. <laughs> Benko. There's Benko. no way to. There's no way to sand down or, or sand spots or anything like that. I mean. Okay. So okay. Uh, this Tesla rim I did. So there's a negative side to hot flocking. And the day I was doing this Tesla win, uh, rim, it was windy. It was really windy outside. And we had a lot of dust particulates running around in the shop and I'm sitting here going, Oh my God, this is perfect. Look at this. We're just doing this room. This is, this is how you hot flock. And then right as we're shooting the video, whack, right into the, the fin of the, of the front, a, a, a nice little bug. And I was like, Oh, and that's, there's nothing you can do. Don't put your finger in it. Don't just go. Okay. And now what you said earlier, you like to, pull out the rim and inspect it when it's not fully cured. Now, I already knew that sucker was ruined. I was like, God damn it. I'm going to have to redo this. And, you know, we're doing it. But it was kind of a divine thing because now we can talk about this. So what I do is I put it back in the oven and fully cure it. And the reason why is you don't want to sand an unpartially rim, a cured rim. It, it gets gummy. Uh, you'll have all kinds of problems. You'll have, you'll, you can actually make even more problems for yourself by not fully curing it. So I put it in the oven, I fully cured it, I pulled it out, and all I did is just went there with a little 120 grit and went and problem solved, and I blew it and put it back in, and I preheated it up to 260 degrees, and I just did another cold coat, but it was warm, you know? And that's another thing, I never do just dead cold, dead cold stuff. That's another thing you want to stay away from doing. You want to preheat your parts always. Uh, it, it just makes it easier. If, if there's a little heat on your part, it's going to stick so much easier. And you don't have to have your KV settings up all the way. You know, you can, I always run my gun at the uh, Faraday cage mode. It's just you won't have any problems. You won't have any back ionization. You won't have the, the static discharge problems. Uh, it, it just all goes away. And... That was kind of like a, another thing, you know, I, I was in my shop, you know, when I was first learning how to do this, nobody told me this stuff. So I was having mistakes left and right. And, and it was just like, you pull it out of the oven and you just go, oh, I got to do this over again, you know? And, you know, that just ruins your day when you got to redo something. It's just like uh, mind boggling how much time's involved when you start redoing stuff. So the key to this business is to get it done first time. So take your time. Do it right and basically slow your roll and, you know, just do it the way I'm showing you, man. I'm telling you, once I learned my way, I just I, I was like, oh, this is how you do it. 
And nobody taught me this. I did this. I learned this on my own. Uh, I saw some videos on YouTube, different guys doing different stuff, but Love I kind of, but I, yeah, it, University of YouTube, it's, it's the way yeah. to go. You know, people talk about going to college. No, just watch YouTube in the field you want to be. And you'll, you'll, you know, if, if it's a good source, you'll get valuable information. Uh, so uh, that said, can we go to this uh, 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 hey, Tesla yeah. rim? I have a quick question first. Sure. Hey, we're talking about if there's an error, you put it in, do a full field. Yes. Uh, I've always been told, like, if you cure something, you take it out and you put another layer on top. By the time you cured that second layer, you over bake the first one and like it'll be a peel easier or chip easier. Do you find that a factor of men? No, no, not at all. And, and you know, it, it, you can, it's amazing how many layers you can put on. Now I don't do full cures throughout this whole process until the final, the right. final coat. But if I have a mistake and I have to fix it, I do cure it. Okay. And the reason why is because it will sand out easier. And I've never had a job come back because it delaminated or the rims were chipping because, you know, we're using quality powders, you know, uh, stay away from the Chinese stuff, you know, uh, just buy the good stuff. It's, it, you know, uh, buy, I use Tiger Dry Lac. It's one of my favorite powders to, to work with. I use prismatic powders. Uh, when I need like just a small amount of something special, I'll go to Columbia Coatings because they have great little small packages and they give me 99% of the time I get really nice powder from them. And same thing, but you'll get your occasional fluke bad batch powder from even the uh, Tiger Dry Lac. I've gotten some stuff where I just went like, what the hell is this? Uh, you know, and this is the way it is, you know, so. You know, you yeah. guys got to be careful when you say China, because I just <laughs> found out yesterday that all the TGIC components, the polymers for TGIC are manufactured, all of them. 100% are manufactured in China. So be careful <laughs> when you say that, Ross, because that's the problem with supply disruption that I found out yesterday from Kevin Biller and uh, hopefully a podcast sooner coming out. But, you know, it's uh, we're addicted to the cheap, uh, the way that China sells us the stuff we need is cheap and we're always we love a good deal right Ross you love a good deal <laughs> I love a good deal but you know I I didn't buy a Chinese gun I, no. bought, I bought the German Wagner uh, my first gun actually was a cheap Chinese uh, Eastwood hot coat like $99 special that's what I learned with and I did it right out of a normal home oven uh, and that's, you know, I, I got paid right the second powder coat job I did. I got paid for it. Uh, it was amazing. And it's just like your story, you know, you, you, you got your home shop and now you, you got three weeks of work out. Uh, that's, that's a good sign. It's time to start looking at full time at what you do. And, uh, the only advice I can give is when you buy like, uh, certain parts, like the gun is so important, you know, uh, I, I bought my Wagner uh, EPG 207 uh, back in, I think it was a 2003, I can't remember. But anyways, that back then was the top of the line gun. And, and it didn't have the pre-settings and all that. You had to actually physically go in there and change it. And nobody, I, I, nobody back then knew, what, you know, it was just like, oh, just kind of bring it down a little bit. That should give you better results. And, you know, okay, well, you know, that's what I did. I brought it down a little bit. And I found, oh, that works good. Uh, but when I got this uh, new Wagner, the Sprint has all the presettings, and I I was like I, I, I you know I read the manual on it, and the first thing I, I, I the first thing I did is I went to the Faraday, Faraday cage mode and I pushed it to see where the settings were, and I went I went ah be damn that's where I powder coat at, and I was just like oh my god, and I said <laughs> you know that's just you know you know so uh, also on the settings uh, sometimes I bring them down on the second coat so. Um, uh, you know, one question I keep getting asked that I cannot answer to people, difference between KV and microamps. When would I bring them up? Why would I bring them up? And like, it's not a night and day question on this does this and this does this. I just well, no, it is. It is a night and day question. Okay, so. 
Okay, uh, KV, kilovolts. So that's basically, it charges the particles and makes them stick to your, your substrate uh, that you're shooting. So if you want it to really stick, you bring that, that up. If you don't want it to stick, you bring it down. Now, the microamps. This is a little more complicated. Uh, there's uh, basically three things. Well, here, let me go over the microamps first. The microamps, uh, <laughs> um, I'm trying to put this in the, have you ever played music? Do you, do you, have you been in a band or do you, okay. All right, they make a piece of equipment. It's called a compressor limiter. And basically that is the only thing I've seen in any other application that's identical to what this does. And basically when you set your milliamp, uh, your microamps, it's basically telling the gun that when you get too close to your substrate, it locks it down so it doesn't give you too much current. It's, 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 it's a limiter. It limits the amount of, uh, of current going onto your, your, your piece. So it, it, it reduces the amount of back ionization and all the problems, uh, the pinholes and dimples and all that stuff. But as you know, it, it doesn't work all the way. So, and obviously you don't wanna bring that down to zero because it wouldn't work. So there's, there's, a, there's a fine line between where you want it at. So uh, I have found that uh, around uh, uh, 40 is a nice number and you can, and when you go to the second coat, I bring it down 10 to 30. So, and, I, and that's what I do. I bring the whole, the whole thing down across the board by 10 points. Uh, so when I do another coat. And then if I do a third coat down even again, because it's like, you don't wanna have the problem of redoing the rim. Now, if you're hot flocking, you don't have to worry about that. You can just keep it all at that setting all the way through because it's flowing out and you're not gonna, but when you're, when you're doing the colder coats, you have to be very careful and bring those levels down, but always keep, but always keep your air up. And that's another thing because uh, a lot, they don't discuss this. And so uh, if you're doing a third coat, you need to be farther away from the rim than from your first coat and your second, every time you do a layer, you want to get a little farther back because you don't want those problems. So bring your air up. So you, it makes the cloud go out to the part. So See, that's what that confusing part is. Cause like the KB, I definitely get it. It's charged particles. It's going uh, to the substrate and it's sticking to the substrate. We, I do all those steps just as because that's what I was taught, but understanding okay. that that microamp, like if my KB is what's charging that particles to get it to the substrate, the current, like what really is that microamp really doing? Is it charging something? Is it not charging something? Why is it important? It's a safety mechanism in the gun to keep you from having mistakes. And it basically just limits the current down. So when you get too close, it just goes, whoa, 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 hey, stop that. And it just brings it down and clamps it. It's a limiter. It limits. So it's limiting the KB more or less. Like you got mm -hmm. the KB out there and it's limiting. Okay, there, it, there's three things to a, a, a powder cloud. You have the KV, you have yep. the actual uh, microamps, and then you have the flow of air. Right. So uh, it, it, it limits the current, which is a combination between the KV and the UV, so you or the microamps, it, it limits those. So it does bring it down. So when you, it, it's hard for me to explain this, but when you get closer <laughs> to your part, when, what kind of gun do you have? Uh, I have the KFX1. Okay, I'm not uh, familiar with it. But if it has like digital, like line, down, you know. As you get closer, oh, it will drop. And as you get by the way, it'll that's that's your 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 microamp limiter working right there. As you're getting closer, it's locking it. It's it's limiting it, so you don't so have don't all that. One thing, basically, I mean, instead of why have this range from zero to a hundred, but all it's doing is limiting. Why is why not just okay? I'm going to put it on limiting, and it will limit itself. Why is there those adjustments to a hundred? <laughs> Uh, it's, I, I, you know, I understand what you're saying. And quite frankly, I can't answer that, but okay. it's, it's, uh, it's like, a, uh, like a piece of musical gear. Uh, when you like the compressor limiter, uh, basically there's a threshold rate that you want the noise 
when you're recording a band, like a kick drum on a, a drum set, and you want that, that kick drum, every time the guy hits it, it, it's a very loud thump. And, but then if, if, if the mic was just wide open, it would pick up the guitar guy next to him and the other pieces of a music that's going through. So what it does is it closes, it gates, it, it shuts it off so you don't hear that stuff. And basically, that's what the, uh, the, the microamps is doing. It's basically, it, it's allowing you to get closer to your part without uh, uh, having the adverse side effects. But you, it, it's one of those things, I, I tell you the truth, I don't know enough about it as far as uh, the mechanics of it, but I've just read about it, and, and that's how I understand it as. So um, I could be wrong completely. <laughs> no, and that, no, and that's more of an explanation than I've got, and I've asked for years. That's a question I've put out, and no one's been able to answer. And I like the fact that you answered enough of it, so where if somebody asks me, I can just send them to this <laughs> podcast and say, hey, I still... I get the gist of it, but not enough to help you understand it. So I'll just yeah. make podcast and say, listen to it there. It just limits the, the 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 current flow. It just clamps it down so you you don't make mistakes, but you still make mistakes, and it doesn't solve anything. And that's why you have. I mean, it does, but to a certain degree. But uh, to a point. you know, you, if you come in. <laughs> with the high KV and just get close to that rim, it's just going to go into a bunch of spots on you, you know, so <laughs> be careful. <laughs> what, um, where, where should, do you want me to queue up the video? Uh, I, I think let's just, just go for the, we don't have, I don't know where we were at with it. Just, uh, we did a primer coat, just start with the, the hot flocking part. So we did a primer coat on this Tesla rim. Oh, wait, before we get started, uh, primer coat. So, there's two different primers out there, and I use the Tiger Drylac primers. Uh, there's a dry protector primer, and then there's a zinc primer. And for most aluminum, you want to use the dry protector. Uh, for most steel, you want to use the zinc. So you do a lot of steel rims, you were telling me. Uh, steel and aluminum, both up here, but I'm dealing with salt. That's I usually use zinc even on aluminum, though. So yeah, I well, you... It's a different. It's a different type of uh, of uh, metal sweats differently. Each metal sweats differently, uh, uh, and that dry protector is specifically designed for aluminum. So just to let you know, but you can use the zinc. Uh, it, it, it's better to have a primer on there than no primer at all. So okay, uh, I got two questions here. Uh, Columbia Coatings, have you tried their their primer outgas filler? Yes, to where you can stand that. What do you think? <laughs> I don't use it. <laughs> oh, oh. Just because, like my thing is like, I'm dealing with it. If you ever watch any of my videos, I'm dealing with some pretty bad rims. They come out looking surprisingly really good. But when you look real close, you can tell the divots. And I'd like to find something I can just do a thin layer on, you know, cure it out and do a light sand as a filler. I, I tell you what, the dry protector sands really easy. So when it flashes off, it has a matte appearance. Unlike the zinc primer is shiny. And as you know, anything that's shiny is a pain in the ass to sand. So right. use, use the dry protector. That's what I do when I have like a bad rim. It's, I blast it and they, uh, basically it's just pitted beyond belief. And I'll just put on a thick layer, a super thick layer of dry protector. And then I'll sand it out. I'll do a full cure, like I said, and then I'll sand it out. And, I'll, and then from there, go back and start all over. Usually another layer of dry. One, I'm sorry. 20, what are you sanding at? 120, 280, what? Oh, no, I start with 80 and uh, then I, uh, uh, and then I usually go right to 220 and then that's good. Okay. So, but you can just okay. do 80 grit because it's just, it, it, you know, unless you're doing like, a, a, you know, your final code then you might want to be at a higher, you know, like 220 and up. But uh, if you're just getting all the crap out of it and trying to smooth it out, just stay at 80 grit. Uh, it knocks it down. And knocks it down. Nice. <laughs> yes. So uh, this, we did this rim and dry protector. So this will be good for you to see because you'll be able to see how it, it looks. And you, you're, once you see it, you're going to go, oh, and it's a lot easier to sand. 
and uh, it, it, it does sand pretty easy. Uh, it's still powder, so it's tough. And uh, yeah, that other stuff, the, 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 don't do that. The bubble gum colored stuff, don't, don't do that. <laughs> uh, that's a quick question. So when you sand it out, uh, what do you do afterwards? Do you just blow it off or do you actually wipe it down with something like acetone to make sure all the- I never out? wipe down with acetone, never. <laughs> that's like, I never do that. I don't use acetone at all. I uh, ever, I just don't use it. I, I, I either, you know, strip it, sandblast it and try not to touch it too much and go into powder coating. Uh, now, if you're sanding something out, blow it off as good as you can and just use a wet, I use wet paper towels. Okay. And I, I, I go in there and then I'll use a dry paper towel and then get off all the water stains from there. And from there, if I have any inclination in my mind that there's a little particle of fiber in there, I just run the map gas torch over it. Oh, I just got, I got right here. So we do the I same thing map gas. <laughs> this is your best friend. Yeah, you know, I agree. Just, 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 just go real quickly over it. You can't hurt it and it'll, it'll burn any particles off. And uh, from there, you're good to go. So your, your thing on uh, acetone, like we don't use it. Um, I see it going into the substrate. Um, and I think it just adds moisture. So we basically use Eastwood pre-prep. Um, why don't you like acetone? I know why I don't like it because I feel it's putting moisture into my product um, and I have to put it in the oven and heat it up again. A lot of people use acetone, so what's, well, why don't you like the acetone? I've had problems with it. I've had fish eyes happen after, you know, like what the hell is happening here? And uh, it, it all stems from using the acetone. At first I used to, I used to uh, spray it. I had a big old thing of it. I would spray it on there and let it dry off and preheat it. And man, I stopped doing that. Like, well, A, you'll go broke. <laughs> and, and B, it just, it just, uh, it doesn't work. It just it doesn't causes work. more problems than what it's worth, <laughs> you know? You should see, we have like this tiny little bottle. I mean, we avoid it, you know? It's good for maybe a handful of things, but. It's good for getting anything degreased that you need to basically get off the part and uh, you know, other than that. testing surfaces on whether they're painted or powder coated and that's, that's it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's, if you wanna check to make sure your, your part's fully cured, just get a rag with some acetone and if there's any color coming off on the rag, you're not cured all the way, real simple. Yeah. Oh, let me show you, I wanna share this because we did talk about um, uh, outgassing and we do have a pod, a, I mean, a blog on that where I go through um, what it, there's a section in here about primers and why we prefer. Oh, what hey, uh, he, he asked, well, well, stop right there. You see, uh, you were asking me how I hang a rim in one of your questions, that right there. You see how I'm hanging that? Now, that's just, uh, that's just uh, an outer piece of the rim, the inner, excuse me, the inner piece, but you can basically hang a rim completely like that. And you were asking me, so what I do is I basically pre-cook the rim, outgas it out, and then I take that dry protector and I just cake it on there. And if it's really bad, you know, it's gonna, it will sag down and maybe even drip, but it's going down onto the inside. And basically what I do from there is I take a grinder and take all the high spots off. And you'll so you're be- you're not necessarily hot flocking. You're not hot flocking. Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. No, yeah, you hot flock that sucker. Oh, we have some other, we'll show you some other pictures of how we hang it, but. But I just wanted to reference, reference this because we have some pretty good information there on that one. Plus, you can learn about the magnesium and how to do that, you know. But what I was addressing is to you specifically for your steel rims. Uh, oh, that's, yeah. an ex, that, that's an excellent way. Um, do, do we have yeah, that? Let me, yeah, let me show you that. I'll share my screen on, um, on those pictures. Because uh, when you say steel rim, you're talking about where it's, it's a it's a uh, it's a two piece rim essentially that's been welded together, and it has that inner you know, and it outgasses like a mother bear inside. I, I hate it because yeah, it's either too thin in there, or if it's a little too thick, it bubbles. Like one of these rims. Yes. Okay, so that's how I hang it. Obviously, the tire is on there. Uh, so, but I just wanted to, I did that this morning to show you how I hang it yep. okay. and that, that's how I hang it. 
So if yeah, you want it, a, um, so basically that one podcast I say, it's like a bowl and that's like a bowl there. You can, you basically hot flock this sucker, just how it's sitting like that. And you come in there same way, low KV settings and just work your way in there at the primer and then back away and then whoosh, lay it down, layer kick that sucker. Uh, put it on as thick as you want because it's going to just fill in. Uh, now, you got to do this extremely, you got to get it up to temperature for like 20 minutes to reduce and minimize the air bubbles from that one seam where the welds, you know, that you were telling me about earlier where you can't get it yeah, into. I'm miserable. I'm always running into that. So, yeah, there's... <laughs> How do I There's, avoid it? Like, is there any like secret to avoid that? Because I've no. done whole rims because of that before. I got, how about take more uh, aluminum rims instead of steel? <laughs> uh, there is, there's, uh, there's two ways you can, you can alleviate this. And uh, you can, JB weld, you can powder coat over JB weld. And um, I've done that. Not on this, you couldn't do that on this rim because you wouldn't be able to get your finger in there. But like on uh, those older, like uh, the, like the '70s style rims that you see, you can actually get your finger in there where that where those seams meet, and you can fill that. Uh, also, uh, you can do. Um, I mean, if the client doesn't mind, and he really, it's more for protection than looks. Right. You put a bead of silicone over it, and that will. You can powder coat over silicone. A lot of people don't know that. So, uh, especially with that hot locking method, you can you can put that silicone in there. Uh, do your primer coat first. Uh, do your do your color coat. Uh, there's two ways you can do this. You can you can you can basically powder coat over the silicone, and I do that like if you're doing a clear coat, for example, as your final coat. Uh, you basically right before then you, you let it. You're gonna have to let the rim cool and put a bead of silicone, a small bead. And then you can powder coat over it, and it 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 will crack down the road, but it'll be protected. And uh, so you do it at get, the end. Yeah, you, you can do it at the end, or you can do it you can do it at the very end. For example, if you're doing it in black, you can go yeah. get black silicone and just fill that in. The customer won't see it, and and you let the customer know you're doing that. No, obviously. Oh, yeah. And and uh, basically that seals that up, and and it solves your problem. Uh, it does create another problem down the road. If he brings those rims back, you got to get that silicone out because that's a pain in the ass to get out. But well, what about, like we use that uh, Columbia Coatings liquid metal. We use that. If oh, the lab out. metal, the lab metal. Yeah, yeah. that's stuff. I, I've, I've never used it. It's real. I can't get it here because of the hazmat oh, crap. Okay. So uh, I've used uh, basically JB metal, metal weld. Uh, yeah. it, it's rated to 400 degrees. So I basically... Uh, my oven's down about 380 and uh i use that and i've had great results uh can you pull up the tank i did kim oh yeah okay give me a second here so i did this uh motorcycle tank and uh basically it had a bad weld seam in the middle of the tank and uh i just basically said this is really you know most tins get get painted and the guy wanted it powder coat and i said well i can powder coat this but you're going to see the seam. It's horrendous. And, and he said, well, do your best. And, you know, of course he put me to the challenge. And so I basically uh, did a layer of dry protector first over the whole tank, a real thick layer. I mean, I just, I put it on a point where it was just orange peeling and look, look nasty. You know, it's like, Oh, that's way too much. Yeah. That's what I did. And what I did from there is I fully cured it, sanded it out until the metal was showing through the high spots and the low spots and then from there, I basically took a putty knife with JB weld, and I did a layer across the seam. Let it sit overnight, 24 hours, I sanded it out, and I did it again and again and again. So this is a five-day project here we're talking about. And, and then from there, I did a white base coat, and we did a, I think he wanted a pearl, so I did a, a fine sparkle and a clear for him. And it came out amazing. And... You know, people that JB Weld, you can go over and, and and silicone. These are some things that people don't know. You can, uh, and the reason why I say that because uh, like gates and railings, uh, the welders have a hard time getting to certain locations of the of the where the welds are at, 
and they can't right. really fill it in. So, you know, tell, you know, hey, fill that in with silicone. I'll just go over it because it's just a railing. You know, it's not like a show piece of art, even though some of them are, you know, but uh, it, it, you can powder coat over that. You can't see it. And it's it, it looks great. You can't, you know, another thing. So, so I, I guess what's the temperature yeah. that holds up to? Does that hold up to 400 fine? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, There's I'm, a... Thinking about you can just, doing that, that bead just taking my finger, making it nice and smooth, going over the rim, and if I, all my misery with those types of rims are that, that, that crease. Yeah. Well, try one. Do one, and you'll you'll you'll, you'll go. go I'll be damn. I can go over that. But okay. it's also. <laughs> but if you're if you're if you're doing the the rim in black, you can do it after the fact, and and just fill it in. You won't Absolutely. see it, you know, so that's another thing. And they make it in clear, too. So the uh, and tan, they make it all the different colors now, the silicone. But it has to be the high grade silicone, like the bathroom and window seal type silicone. Uh, uh, and make sure it's 100 percent silicone. Because I mean, that's what the plugs are made out that we fill everything with silicone. So, OK, thing. I got the photos ready here for that. Um, <clears throat> so here's that one. Okay, yes. So here's the tank. What it and, look like. I mean, look at that. Can you imagine trying to powder coat that? You'd be like, oh my God, you're going to see every, there's three big notches in the center there. So, uh, uh, and can you show the done product? Um, yeah. Or, or actually show the whole, I think that we did in steps. So I, I basically, this was a challenge for me. And I basically recorded this. I took pictures of how I did this. Okay, so this is the product. Oops. And that's also another thing I want to hit on is take pictures of when you're doing stuff. Because uh, if you discover a new way that really works better, you have documented it. And then you can always go back and go, this is how I did that. And uh, I do that a lot. I take notes. I always have my notepad. I mean, there's times when I, I come up with things. Uh, that just blow my mind away and I just write it down. I go, God, why didn't I do that before? You know? So yeah, we, always, have we, wanna, we have things we want to attempt, but we're just waiting for it to slow down to have enough time to actually do them. No. And you got to, yeah, exactly. Uh, I do the same thing. I have my own line of finishes that I do and uh, I'm always trying to create new ones and uh, you got to, you need to have, got to have that creative spark in you to keep going. So I guess you're having a hard time bringing those up, Kim. Oh, you can't see them? No, I just, well, can you go to the next one? I thought I did. I thought I was sharing them. No. Okay, hold on. Stop share. Let me try it again. <clears throat> I got to have a, a coronavirus. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's that one. Okay, so here you go. You see the, uh, the dry protector. Look at that. Uh, it, it, it's, it's real flat matted sheen. And I had, and after I sanded it, I actually found a little divot on the left hand side and up front. Now the, the JB welds a mother bear to sand that stuff. It gets hard. I mean, like you got to take your time sanding it out. Uh, it takes like an hour just to sand one little section out. So and that is that only white? Does it only come in white? The, the what what the, what, uh, what are we talking? Primer. The primer comes in. It's a light gray. A light gray. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So when we sh colors on top. Yeah, the that's the JB well that you see it start. So I did it. I did the primer first just so I could see the high spots uh, because right. um, auto body fill is a whole different world. That's a whole different. And if you've never done it before, uh, don't don't do it because okay, it's let me it's pause. not easy. Okay, I'm gonna pause it and get to another photo here. So. The, does a gray primer mess with any top colors? Have you found any issues with it bleeding or anything, or it's always been I, fine? It's it's stables can be. It's the best primer I've I've used. Uh, I've never had any problems with the zinc either. Um, you know, uh, the only problem I've had with powders in general is uh, uh, some polyesters. I've had some sag issues with, and. Uh, so I, I, I pretty much say with the TGICs and, and uh, the ones that I know that work. And also that's another thing. So if you get a client that comes up and goes, hey, 
I want to do this color and you've never done it before, test, do it, try it out before you do it on the client. Because especially I have, prismatic. <laughs> I, if, especially if it's a certain company and they send you and it's a, it's a chrome based type of base type deal, you try it out first because you can have bleed through, you can have all kinds of problems that you, you know, why is this happening? And if it's, a, if you can't figure it out, you just tell the client, I can't do that. You know, so uh, we've had that happen. Can you see that? Okay, no. so this is uh, this is like the third layer here, and this is after I sanded it. So you can see the metal sticking through, and you can see the JB weld, and you can see down the bottom there. You can see where the J I stopped it sanding through because it is looking good. So. This is a, a multi-step process, guys, and it takes a lot of time. And, and, but I, basically what I'm here to say is, yes, you can powder coat over JB Weld. There it is, right there. So, but yeah. we'll get- The whole idea that you can use powder as a filler, I mean, that alone is pretty cool too. Yeah, you can really lay it up thick if, and just sand it out. And a lot of your problems are gone. And there's the finished product. Uh, smooth. You wouldn't even know about that beam there. Yeah, I took some pictures outside of it. It has a, a magnificent sparkle in it. So anyways, uh, pretty neat, pretty neat what you can do. And yeah, you can go over silicone and, and all kinds of things you can do with it. No, I like that silicone. I mean, I'm definitely gonna use that because that will stop a major headache. Yeah, and you know, if you're, it, what what do you do most of your rim colors in those steel I mean, rims? Of them, and it annoys the crap out of me. It's black. Well, black. there you have it. I would do it if I was you. I would wait until the very end after the rim's all done and just put a layer of black silicone in there. You're, so if you have any outgassing bubbles, you're not going to see it. It'll just be all covered up. Gotcha. You know, but you can do it. Try, try doing it beforehand and see how the results are with that too. So, so uh, uh, let's, uh, uh, anything else you want to talk about? Um, I, I know we kind of, the whole discussion was about uh, hot flocking and I, I kind of really want to hit that home again for you. Uh, that way you can, let's bring up that Tesla video because the Tesla video is pretty much, uh, the, the rim, excuse me, is um, the proper way how I do it for a customer. And I do the primer coat. And this is me doing the primer coat right here. And no, this I, is the this is after the primer coat. Oh, okay, okay. So we flashed off the primer. Don't do a full cure. Did a flash off. Uh, basically, pull it out of the oven, and it's hot. It's flowing out, hot flocking. Here we go. And this is the same thing. I got the KV down it. Uh, uh, basically, what's that? Hold on, I'm gonna resize the screen here because it's. Hold on. Oh, sorry. Okay, I got a question. I'll make it smaller so you guys can see it. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So, like, you know, winners, uh, rims getting eaten up. One thing I've always kind of was curious on, and I usually leave it up to customers because I didn't really know either way, um, whether I should do a primer coat and then the collar or should I do a collar and then a top coat? Which way okay. would you... No, that's a good yeah. question. That's a good question. So, um, okay, I, you saw the video with my rims. Those are my personal rims. And I, I just, it, the black label basically said, you should do two layers for this rim of the same color. And in my thinking, I'm like, that's all I wanna do. I don't wanna put on three layers. That's a lot of coating to do in one day. So I just basically said, you know, two coats of the same color is basically like doing a primer coat. But the primer does have, utility in what it does. Uh, and like I said, the dry protector is specifically designed for aluminum. Zinc has its properties for steel, and it's basically keeping the, uh, the metal from rusting underneath. Is what it, so it's very important to put those on. And if you're, gonna, if you're gonna do just a color coat and a top coat on an aluminum rim, I would say not a problem. On the steel though, I would definitely put the zinc. Always on the steel, always put the zinc. Uh, it, it will come back to bite you. Uh, that extra layer 
is great for keeping the rust down. I mean, if you've done all your homework on sandblasting and getting it prepped mm -hmm. and you coat it with the zinc and then you do your, your clear coat, uh, your color coat and then your clear coat, that thing's going to be pretty good. It should last you the whole winter. I mean, the, I understand what you're going through. We got roads here in Hawaii that the waves go over and it's, that's probably just as bad oh. as what yeah. you're dealing with. So you, know? you should put it in the three layers instead of just two layers. Uh, there's, Usually it's either a color and then a, a clear top coat or a primer and a color um, just because they usually don't want to spend a lot of money when it comes to beat up steel, You know, steel rims too. It's like, that's another, that's a whole topic in itself because I mean, these steel rims are probably worth a hundred bucks each. And you know, my starting price is a hundred bucks. So, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you don't want to spend that, go buy a new rim. And it's probably cheaper to go buy a new rim. And, you know, it, exactly. So that's a that's a, a legitimate question you're asking. And it's one of those things. Do you want to take that work? Because, uh, you know, it, it's work you probably don't. I don't like doing the steel rims. And I'll actually kind of go, well, maybe you want to buy some nice new aluminum rims or something, you know. Because aluminum will last longer than steel. I mean, it's just that simple. One thing with our powder coating channel, we're noticing where normally we wouldn't take so much off the wall stuff um, because of the channel. Now we take things that other powder coaters around won't touch. Uh, like we just did a heating grate so somebody could turn it into a table. What? Uh, claw foot tub. Uh, right. Sink. Um, oh, I've done, I, I've, I've done everything you have done. <laughs> Right, and, so and we're, we're, gonna, <laughs> we're doing it for the channel, which normally I would like when we're talking, it's like, uh, do we really want to do it? And it's like, well, it's good content for people that will do it. Um, so. It's good content and it's great learning. And you'll, you'll learn a million things from doing those types of projects. You'll, you know, there's like sinks. Oh my God, an iron sink. <laughs> that thing, those things weigh a ton. They're paying the ass of sandblast. And, you know, it's just like, but when you, you can make uh, with a good white, you can make it look better than it originally was. And, you know, the, and the client will be like, oh, my God. And you're like, yeah, but at what cost to you to do that? And that's where, you know, I'm at. I'll just turn jobs away. I'll look at it and go, I don't want to do that, you know. And I try to take the jobs that I like to do. Uh, last week, I took some jobs I didn't want to do. I was like. Uh, but it's slow, you know, we're not busy uh, with this COVID when you're thing. Slow, you got to take anything. At the and you got to take what you can get, you know, and, you know, we're, we're basically in the sandblasting business, the stripping business and <laughs> the powder coating business. So I get people that just want stuff sandblasted and you're just like, oh, uh, uh, you know, because I hate sandblasting. I really do. You know, oh, but I'm the exact sandblasting. I will have something sit a while because I don't want to sandblast it. <laughs> I hate blasting. I have a, I have a whole uh, 54 uh, Ranchero in my blast room, literally a whole car in pieces in my blast room. And I'm just like, I just don't want to do it. I just, I, I, want, I want, I want to be doing this and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Sounds like content for another show for sure. <laughs> okay. But what, a, okay. So uh, let me kind of reshare my screen again and go through this video because one of the things I didn't hear you say, Ross, was you when you're done, you go you go three times on the outside, right? Well, okay. No, it's generally on the cold coat, it really depends, but it's I usually do two solid passes on the cold coat. So here we have, this is where we hot flock in the uh, Tesla room. I had done the inside already, and now we're going to the problematic areas, the lug nut holes. And on these Tesla rims, every one of those fins in the corner is a pain about to get. And, and you'll find most rims are like that, where the, where the fins come in and the corners are really hard to get into those inside corners. So this is where hot flocking is. I mean, look, you can... You can see that I got all the way into the lug nut, all the way in there, and it's no problem. And you just keep your air down at 37. You get in nice and close. You make sure that powder cloud, it's, you barely see it. That's how small of a powder cloud it is. 
So when you pull the trigger, you're going to be like, oh, wow, that's barely any. That's, that's exactly the way you want it. And then it, it's just like coloring. Pretend you're coloring. You're just coloring the whole rim. See how I come in there and I'm just working those grooves. I go side to side on the grooves. And then I get the rest of the fin. So each rim is a little different. Uh, you know, I like earlier on my rim, I was doing circular patterns. Well, I did circular patterns on the start with the lug nuts, but now I'm doing side to side because this rim is a lot more, you know, contrasted that way. So it just really depends on what you're doing. There is no written rule. It says you have to do it a certain way, but you'll find that uh, once you become ingrained with the way to do it and stay with that all the time, it reduces your errors. So there I did one pass, hot. And you can see if you're light anywhere. I mean, you literally, you don't have to go through the whole steps. You literally are looking at it and being like, okay, yeah. no, nothing's yep. light. Look, see how the rim's cooling down already and it's not completely falling out. Because mm -hmm. I, you know, this is a big rim. It's like a 20 inch rim. And it cools down pretty quickly. Once you pull it out of the oven, you'd be surprised how fast those things cool down. So Did you guys I, see the bug? I zoomed in on the bug. <laughs> yeah, so this is, uh, yeah, the bug. <laughs> the bug. <laughs> the bug. The bug. And it, you know, it was just one little speck in the finish. And if it wasn't, if it was anywhere else, it would have been fine. But it was right on one of those fins, so it, you had to, I had to sand it out. But I'm basically finishing off the rim. I have brought the air back up to 50% now, and I'm doing the hub or the barrel, excuse me. And uh, with more air, it's easier to do one quick pass. And because it's it's the inside, you don't see it. I that's why I bring the air up. And next. Uh, we're going to be doing the rim while it's cold, so you need the air up anyway. So I already put it in that position. So yeah, the bug happened, and we just continue to work on it. I mean, yeah, well, there's nothing, there's nothing you can do. You know, if you see a, a mistake already, you're like, oh, well, you're going to have to put it in the oven and cure it because you gotta, you're going to have to sand it out. You know, uh, you know, if you if you're comfortable sanding it with just a, uh, uh, a partial cure then do that. But I, I'm not comfortable doing that. I, I've had stuff gum up on me and stuff. So I just cure it out all the way. Makes it easier to deal with. I don't know what you're talking. You're probably talking, saying the same thing you just said in this video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I gotta lose weight. <laughs> <laughs> well, have a beer. <laughs> Okay, so I wanted to yeah, let so me show we'll you the picture of the bug or do you, what do you what No, do you that mean? that's that doesn't really matter. Uh, what's important here is the second coat. And cuz okay. I never we didn't really show that in the first video. So we have hot flocked this the whole rim and now what we're going to do is we're letting it cool down. And like I said, this is important. You want it to be about 180 to 200 degrees if you're using your infrared uh, thermometer, uh, or if you do an old school method, I'll just go back there with my hand against the tape in the backside of the rim. And if I can put my hand up there and hold it there for a moment where it doesn't hurt, that's the right temperature. So we let it cool down because we don't want it to flow out now anymore. Because if you keep putting it on and it's flowing out, it's so easy to put too much on. That's why you want to do it with the air down because it's impossible to put too much on. And it, when you do it then with the next layer, what I'm doing, then you get this perfect uniform coating. Okay, let me ask you this. So you hot flock your base layers uh, when it comes to your clears or your tops, candies or whatever, do you hot flock those or do you put them on uh, basically warm to where they're powder, not hot flocking because it's a top coat? Good question. And I never hot flock the clears or the or, or those, no, I just, I get the, I get the rim up to temperature. And if we can't, if you can't get the powder into the lug nut holes, for example, let's say it's a chrome and you hot flocked it all chrome and you got it deep down on the lug nut. 
uh, and then you want to get that color code in there, uh, there's the bug. <laughs> uh, but uh, you just basically are going to have to live with a little bit of imperfection when you're doing the candies and the translucents because it is so easy to have problems by putting too much on or not enough on. And it, that, I, that we, that's a whole nother topic in itself, candies and translucents. And yeah, so you can see here, I'm at 190. And I basically I was telling you, look, I can keep my hand up on it and it doesn't hurt and uh, we're ready to go. So that was basically, we had let five minutes go by with the, with the motor on, the booth was still on. Uh, it doesn't take long. And then we're gonna come back here and we're gonna do the same thing, but the error is up now, we're at 50%. Uh, the settings are still, I, oh wait, I did turn the, uh, the KV and the UV down. So I was, I was at, uh, the KV was at 70 and the milliamps were at 40. And so I brought those down by 10 across the board. So we're now at 60 and 30. And we are going to get to this. It's like major slow-mo. Oh, I know. <laughs> it's, it's just the, uh, the feed. Yeah. Hopefully it won't come like this when you watch the, uh, the podcast. So how do you like that Wagner compared to your, your other guns? Is it like the best of the best you've had so far? Or did you, have you liked a previous gun better? Well, I had originally, like I said, the Eastwood uh, cheapy $99. That's what I started with. And then I got uh, uh, the Wagner EPG 207. And I, when I got that, I was just, my mind was blown. How much, I mean, because I, I went from 99 to 5,000, you know. And, <clears throat> and at that point, I realized, geez, this is expensive. And I dropped the gun one day really hard on the nozzle. And uh, I, I was down. I was literally down. I, so I ordered a Columbia Coatings hot coat or cool coat. I think it was a cool coat gun. They're like a thousand bucks. And I, I ordered that. And, and uh, I, I ran that for a little while until I got my replacement parts. And uh, I, was, I was having fantastic results actually with that Columbia Coatings uh, hot coat gun. Uh, it was really easy to use uh, in a way more simple, uh, uh, but it wasn't the same as like a $5,000 gun. And it, it's amazing the difference which you can get with a really nice gun. It's just like spray painting. You can go to Home Depot and go get a nice Husky HVLP for, you know, 50 bucks. But, you know, if you go to the paint store and go buy an Iwata or the Vilbis, you know, you're talking like four or $500 for a spray gun. There's a big difference between how those guns spray. And it's the same thing with the powder coating gun. Uh, you know, I would like to try one of those Norsens guns. I, I, I really would. The USA made guys. Now, okay, so we're going over this uh, with the, the second coat. I went from the back and now just, I always start in the rear and then work to the front and then I do the, uh, the barrel. So uh, you can see how far away I am. I'm not getting close. I'm very far away. You know, you, do, you don't want to get close. You get too close, you're going to have back ionization, uh, dimples, all that stuff that you read about, that it, 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 it's a problem. And even with the settings, with the, the, the micro amps down, it still can happen. So uh, it, just keep your distance. And, and that's probably the most important rule, keep your distance when you're doing it cold. And uh, uh, don't get too close. Uh, you'll just, you'll have problems. You'll, it's just, it's really, it rears its ugly head real quick. And there's not much you can do but blow it off and start over when it's cold. But even then, it's weird. It's like once that static discharge happens, it's like the rim is in, it's infected and you can't get rid of it. So it's like you got to go put it in the oven and, and, and neutralize it, you know. So, so just, just keep your distance when you're always doing these colder coats. But with it still warm at like 180 to 200 degrees, it's much easier to deal with. Now, you can, if you look closely in there, you can see it's shiny. So I didn't get the powder all the way in there, but when it's done, you don't see that. Don't that. So what do you think of some of these newer, some of these knockoffs, these Chinese knockoffs, quote, 
um, that had the KB adjustments and stuff as starter guns for uh, people when you're looking around that thousand fifteen hundred instead of five grand. I mean, I, I personally think more or less everything is more or less the same. Like, it, but it's not. You know what I'm saying? Uh, especially around that price point, most things are the same, whether it, whatever brand it is, until you jump up to something like you have. Right. Okay. I, I think if I was going to buy uh, uh, another gun, uh, I would, I would go in the secondary market. Uh, first and finishing, he sells uh, uh, the Gima Optiflex machines. Uh, you can find those used for like 2300 2400 and, you know, so for another $1,000 or $800 more, you're getting a used refurbished, which is, you know, that's the way to go, um, it, you know, if you're on a budget. Uh, but if you're going to buy the like Chinese, I, I go with the high colo. I, I think that's what I would go with. Is the high like, <laughs> that's what I got right there. Okay. So it's yeah. all got... The high like call. Do you like it? It's I, I do. Um, I sell it uh, with all the guys, my subscribers, and everything. I've sold nine of them and not made a penny out of it, just to help uh, the guys. Um, my mm -hmm. whole between my normal job and powder coat, I'm I'm fine financially. So um, my whole channel is to help guys, not make money off them. So I do whatever I can to help them. And we've sold nine of them already. Great, great. Awesome. But I do like them. I do. And um, so a subscriber that's new to powder coating, of course, you don't want them to just jump into a $5,000 gun because they may not even know if they like it. Exactly. Um, I always suggest something like you said, a, a Columbia coating gun, that 500 to a grand range, whether it's a smooth co or a kkhd before you jump up um what do you what do you suggest i definitely don't suggest the uh, an eastwood pos or anything like that <laughs> well i started with the the eastwood and uh, i can I, I can i can say i mastered that thing it was uh it was a fine work of art uh but that said uh yes definitely i think you're right uh, the the cool coat gun uh, is a great gun, you know. Uh, it, it has all the functions you need. Uh, it's just not the same as a five. I mean, when you pull the trigger on your five thousand dollar gun, you go oh, and you see that powder cloud come out. You're like, I I you, I get it. This is what <laughs> I'm paying. This is what I'm paying for. And it, it, it's all the electronics. And I took my first Wagner apart. I took the whole, so I could see the motherboard. I wanted to see what was going on in there. And I was amazed. I was like, wow, this is high, this is good stuff. Now I took the cool coat apart and I was looking at the soldering and I was like, oh my God. It was like, <laughs> looked like I, I think I could have done a better job. I was like, oh my God. So it's like, you know, there's, you know, I'm not knocking the, the, the cheaper Chinese stuff because you have an absolutely great point there. I mean, you don't want to go out and put a $5,000 dent in your wallet just for something that you just want. If you're just a weekender or, or if you're just starting, go, start small and work your way up. But once you're ready to make the leap and you're like, I want to do this, I think what you're doing is fine. Uh, stay with that machine. It's it's a good machine. Uh, but when you got, you know, once, once you get a big job that comes through and you say, hey, you know, I don't want to go buy one of these you know, make sure you got the money, make the job pay for the machine is basically what I'm getting at. And good point. that's uh, yeah. a good point. Yeah, you know, my, my wife watched me eventually because just because we're getting so much work uh, to possibly do this full time. But I have a fear, like I have a good career and a good job. My fear is right now I enjoy powder coat and I love it. I look forward to it. Not the blasting part, the powder coat. <laughs> part. Um, my fear is, when I start depending on it and need it for my livelihood, that I'm going to lose my love in it and the interest in learning more about it. Cause right now I still want to learn about it and I'm going on three years of doing it. And then in the past did it for three years for a relative. So 
that, that's a scary jump. I mean, some of the guys that are my subscribers, uh, like deep co uh, deep stage and stuff like that, you know, or Jimmy, them guys are awesome because they took out leap. Um, I just, that's a big leap for me. So. It's, it's a big leap for anybody who wants to be in business period, because it is a, it's an act that only you can do. And you have to take that jump and you, it, it is a jump and there is uncertainties. Uh, but once you do it, you're, you, you're already, believe it or not, you've done it already. Right. I yeah. can, I can, I can tell by your shop. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I, I see, I see what's going on there. So uh, you, you have done it already. Uh, it's, and if you got two weeks out of jobs, that's telling me you're ready to really start promoting your business. And this is where Kim comes in. Because oh, it's so nice of you to cue me <laughs> in because you could just tell by the look on my face. I mm. wanted to say something. <laughs> because what is really important in this business is the Instagram, the Facebook. Most importantly is word of mouth. I always thought word of mouth is, uh, but you know, we, we created a great web page. That was the first thing I did when I, when we got this business going, I said, we need a web presence. And I said, geez, it just, it just a stupid web page that says Maui powder works is all we need just so we can get the Yelp, you know, by getting the Google and all that. And we did that. We, for 500 bucks, I set up a web page and, and all of a sudden we got the Google and Yelp stuff. And then from there, it has been an evolution that will drive you down the rabbit hole. And that's where your business will, it's very important, is, is to have these fundamental basic building blocks of your business. If you're going to yeah. do this jump that you want to do, uh, there's a lot of things. Go see an accountant uh, before you do this. Uh, you, I mean, there's, I can tell you all the things that mistakes I've done. I did them. I'm still here. I'm and I'm rocking and rolling. And you've you've got it. You're doing it. You know that's it. You know. Okay, you're, I'm gonna talk now. All right, I have to go to the restroom. I'll be back in a minute. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the thing about is how we transitioned is we had a uh, re an established refinishing business. Um, here already. Um, so we already had another business where we were painting furniture. We'd already kind of done that for quite a while and had mastered all of that. And then, and we were also doing re remodels and uh, redos and stuff in our vacation rental, in the vacation rental industry. And so for us, it, when he, when he decided he wanted to go full time, uh, we already had a pretty strong side hustle going, you know, so uh, you should evaluate your sales before you do that, you know, start tracking your sales over the last two or three years to say, okay, is it, is it kind of flat or is it going up? Is it, you know, what is it doing? Um, because you have to have that forward momentum going um, before you start to shutter down another business or shut her down your employment somewhere else. The other thing is you can build like what Ross was saying is start building that social media presence that, um, you know, that, that, that extra, you know, support that you need because marketing is important. Get your page on the directory, you know, um, we're going to announce something really big coming up uh, where we're going to help powder coders get that established. It's called the coder brand, coder brand package or level up your powder coder game or whatever. It's, it's along those lines. And we're coming out with that uh, probably in a podcast after this one. So we're we're seeing this from our perspective just because we've been there and we know where we're going now. Um, you know, whereas you guys don't see that just yet. And uh, we've made all the mistakes with our website. We've done all the social media stuff. Um, we've learned what has worked and what hasn't. And we know we know those platforms like Instagram, 
Facebook and, you know, in, and YouTube now is kind of a new avenue. This is a new one that's opened up with you and a few others. That's kind of interesting um, because you can you can get a lot of other powder coaters following you, but can you get another, can you get your customers following you on YouTube? That's interesting. I don't know if you can, but anyways, look at your sales, level up your powder coater game uh, with uh, a nice website or a landing page, because let me tell you, SEO and getting on the first page and all that, it's, it's hard to do. So, if you don't have that kind of time to really spend on SEO and getting all that ranking stuff you need, then there are some other things. And that's part of what we're gonna introduce next week with the package is we're gonna do it for you and get you set up and started. Uh, but those are some, you know, getting your social media going, getting your marketing going. These are all things that you can do before you make that big leap trying to get it get it set up ahead of time because right now uh we have our web page uh we have our google i mean we have companies local that have been powder coating for years um and my google reviews are higher than them of course i ask every customer i'm like please leave a review good or bad i don't care reviews a review um just to get the, the numbers up um but basically my business is all word of mouth we don't advertise nothing and we're behind as it is like I just yeah. did a you can do a lot on Instagram and yeah the first of all if you don't have a 4.5 or higher on Google guess what you're shit <laughs> you're shit Google <laughs> does not um you're basically not recognized you'll you'll be sitting low on rankings um in search rankings because of it. So the most important thing for you to do on the Google business page is to keep it active, make sure it's accurate and explore every avenue that they give you in the Google business page um, profile, business, it, yeah. This, this is a lot of work that she's talking about and I don't do that. I, I run my shop. I'm I'm all about the coding. I deal with the customer. My wife does all this that you're talking about right now. And it, it's very, uh, I mean, you got to be a team. You and your wife have to be a team and you have to delegate things that you're strong at and that she's strong at. And, and if, if she's not good at that, you need to, you need to find somebody that is and, and spend a little money. Uh, because it's very important to have the rating. Uh, once you, like you said, a, 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 you know, a review is a review. I just need to get the ratings, and it's very, it, it is important. Obviously, good ratings are better. Uh, and back to word of mouth, though, that is fundamentally the most important thing on the planet. Is you want to be known as the guy in your area, and once people say, they go, oh, that's the guy. We'll see that guy, you know, once you are known as that, you're on top. So, and then it's just a matter of having the other pieces fall in place, the web page and all that. So work on your skills, hone your skills. Uh, you know, this hot flocking episode that we've just done is going to help you uh, make things quicker and easier for you. And you'll, you'll have the perfect jobs coming out now. And I hope that really does work for you. And, and, and you will find that, it just gets easier and easier and easier as this goes on. Uh, and you'll want to leave your job because you'll start making money. And, you know, the, your business should be, you know, based on your location, uh, just a mom and pop operation like you guys, you should be doing at least 400,000 a year, no problem. So, uh, you know, these are things you need to, to be looking forward and shooting, having goals and, you know, what, what, how much money do I need to make? You know, I don't know what you're making at your job, but this is also a, a scary time with the COVID and all that stuff. And so, you know, keep your job, you know, because if it's a good paying job, you know, uh, this is almost uh, like the rims business and doing stuff like that. It's almost discretionary income. So, you know, that, that spigot could get turned off real quick. 
you know, then there's the, con there's the construction side. Uh, and that's where, you know, I like to, uh, that's where I like, that's my specialty. I, I mean, I love doing rims and stuff like that, but uh, it, you have to really slow down and take your time with rims. Not that I, uh, I don't slow down and take my time with the construction jobs. It's just that that stuff is wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. And it's in and out of your door and it's money uh, where the rims is like, whoa, you got to slow down. You got to make sure, you're, you know, if you have like a little bug in a, in a, in a stanchion railing that's going to a resort, they're not going to bitch about that, you know, but if you got a little bug in the, in the face of the rim, uh, they're going to bitch about that, you know, or, or you won't be the guy, <laughs> which is important. No more the guy. Yeah. <laughs> That's one thing. I mean, with us, I do the powder coat and I deal with the, the customers and uh, my wife, thankfully, I started doing the Google and stuff. And I was like, so she took over it and like she even does my camera for our YouTube videos and mine too. Yeah, like you guys, it works good as a team. Yes, oh, definitely. But, but make no mistake, we have our arguments. <laughs> <laughs> We are. <laughs> ah. What'd you say? <laughs> That's why we're facing in opposite directions on the podcast. Uh, <laughs> you're in a different. You're in a whole different room right now. What are you talking about? <laughs> Look, they're in the same room. <laughs> That's what happens when you're younger. <laughs> you see, we're, we're we're a little older than you guys. Uh, we've been <laughs> getting out there. We're getting out there. <laughs> well, that's awesome. I hope you guys do make that transition. But, you know, there are certain things you, you need to kind of uh, you want to think of it all because the last thing you want is how come we didn't think about that, <laughs> you know, when you're making such a big leap. Um, how many people are in your area? Is it, our I don't know. Our you're like a, you're rural. Oh, very, very, and it's and it's weird. Like, where am I? Like, I had somebody call me, uh, a customer call me two days ago, want me to do her rims, and I was like, I'm sorry, I'm out like until the end of uh, January. I was like, uh, my buddy uh, Garby Coatings, he started. He's one of my subscribers too. I was like, he can do your rims. I can get you in sooner. And she's like, oh, no, I'll wait. I'll wait for you. And it's like, oh. Okay. And then we had somebody from Maine call us that saw our YouTube channel and wanted us to do her jewelry. She does bracelets. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so she's sending us one up, up here so we can go through the process, see, you know, how much it's going to cost and everything. I think I'm going to do a video to help. We had one of those calls. On that. <laughs> yeah, we had, we've had those calls. Uh, uh, oh, by the way, chains and bracelets, very difficult to do. <laughs> right. I've done them. Yes, I've done them. <laughs> so, know, she has a bracelet and I was like, send one up and we'll figure out like what it will take. And I've never done one of those. But, and I told her, you know, I've never done them before, but I'm definitely willing to give it a shot. Anything that has a moving part that opens or closes you're going to have difficulty doing. Um, and, you know, it's just one of those things. But uh, hopefully it's a simple piece. But, uh, for example, like, solid. go ahead. Oh, okay. Solid. <laughs> okay. I asked her that. I was like, does it have clasps or anything mm -hmm. else? <laughs> powder if it's moving. And she said, no, they're, they're solid uh, bracelets or whatever. And I was like, okay. I, I got to tell you this funny story. So I had this guy come in and he, and he's wearing this big like gangster chain, you know, and he goes, I want this done. And I was like, Oh, okay. I go, well, it's going to be solid when it's done. And he's like, solid, you know, and I didn't understand. Like, <laughs> And I was like, okay. And I was like, all right. So I did his piece for him and, uh, it, and I give it to him and I'll never forget the look on his face when I handed it to him. It was like a lay, you know, but it was just solid. And he, I go here and I put it over his head and he, he was like, solid, you know, <laughs> like, no, it's not solid. It's <laughs> solid. <laughs> he just had a little. Go with it. It's crazy. We actually had a, a lady call us and ask us if we could uh, do her car. Yeah. I was like, uh, what, what part of your car? And she's like, the car. 
<laughs> so I actually, I do a lot of uh, panels for cars. Uh, uh, in fact, I was telling you, I have a whole 64 Ranchero in my thing. So we, yep. we basically, we sandblast it down. Uh, I use the whole tight to clean it. Uh, I don't use the acid with steel. So uh, earlier in the video, I was showing you the cleaning process with doing OSFO. Um, you, I think you said you use the all prep from Eastwood, was it? Anyways. Uh, Eastwood paint prep. Okay, that's a little different. Uh, it's, it is an acid still, uh, but uh, have you heard of hold tight? No. Okay, uh, do a research on that. Uh, this is very important. Uh, because it's not an acid, it doesn't leave a film on the metal. And for steel, like your rims that are steel, any steel part, you can use this solution. You mix it, I think it's uh, uh, 12 ounces to every gallon of water. And it's very expensive. A bottle is like 100 bucks. But it goes a long ways. And you just basically, you blow off your part, and then you take the sprayer, the Johnson sprayer, and then you rinse it with it. And then you just let it dry. You don't put any more water on and it will keep steel from flash rusting here in Hawaii for two days, which we have, we have like 60% humidity on a normal day, you know? So, it, you know, it's, it's a good thing is what I'm getting at. When we, when we do, yeah, when we do our steel rims, we use that after blast, after blast from Eastwood. Yes. If, if we know it's gonna set for a couple of days, we use that. But our issue, like you said, it has that film to where if we don't clean it off, it's it's a big okay. So that's so I stopped using that stuff because of the film, and because of that film, you can have rejection rates. And go with the whole tight; it'll change your whole world. Okay, so you would do that. You do your B seventeen. You do your blast, and you do your the whole tight and then out gas or out gas and the whole tight. No, do the do the whole type clean. You're cleaning the, the surface, and then basically put in the oven and out gas it. And 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 I sometimes I tape it before I do that, uh, just because it's it, it's once I pull it out of the oven, we're hot flocking, we're going to town, you know. So uh, it just depends on how you're dealing with the piece you're doing. So uh, yes, you want to do that and use that the stuff. It's 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 critical. It changed my whole world. Uh, I was like always dealing with steel and it's, you know, that, that it's the phosphorus is what you're seeing is that film. And right. it's just, it's just, it's a, it, it you shouldn't powder coat over that. Uh, it, I've seen total rejections from that stuff. Uh, so, you know, a lot of guys, they go over with the green scratchy, you know, before they do it and blow it off, but you, it, it doesn't work. Um, so the whole tight is a cleaner. It basically gets, it's, it's amazing. It will go, it will clean your room like you just did it with water. All your dirt and contaminants, you see it just come right off and there's no rust or rust flashing and it doesn't rust flash for up to two days. So if you're sandblasting for somebody, you can charge them for that and say, okay, uh, I, I just sandblasted your part and I just hold tighted it. It's totally clean, ready to go. But you got two days to get this to primer shop, you know, so... Uh, that's one of the things we do. I like to do it because it cleans the metal perfectly. Because uh, even after sandblasting, even if you blow it off as good as you can, there's still dirt on that sucker. You're, and not, even you'll... It. You're not even waving it or nothing after that? No, I just take the whole wand and you saw me doing the rims with the, yep. uh, uh, I just oh. basically, I might have my hand on the rim to hold it from sp just spinning around, but that's it. That's, that's all I do. And then you and, use water. You use no water. water. No water of the hold tight. It's just hold tight only. So you blow it off, then you use the hold tight, and then uh, uh, here, let me go get the bottle. Oh, I was going to pull it up on the internet, but yeah. So what one was it that he did uh, the water on when he was spraying it and then did the water to rinse it off? That was um, the acid. <laughs> It was OSFO. Yeah, for the rims we were doing in the video demonstration, those yeah. were aluminum. And aluminum, I always use the acid because it's cheaper. This stuff is expensive. It's a hundred bucks for this stuff. That rim, the I, other stuff with the aluminum. When I'm, when I'm doing steel, I use this. 
I use the OSFO or the uh, JASCO metal prep and, or you use concrete cleaner. It's all the same stuff. It's a iron okay. phosphate basically is what you're using. So, um, and you dilute that uh, cool. uh, one part to three parts. But with this, it's uh, uh, I believe 12 ounces for every gallon. So uh, it's really amazing. This, this, this was created for the slurry blasting guys. Okay. The guys that use those uh, dustless blasters. Yep. I was looking at buying one of those and, <laughs> and I was like, what do I need? You know, before I buy something, I research it thoroughly to see what I need to make it run. And I, they were sh in the video showing this guy's using this. And I was like, hmm. Because in their video, they're saying, oh, yeah. And then you just rinse it with, this, it, with the whole type solution when you're done and, and on off you go. And I was like, going, wow, uh, well, that should just work in a sprayer bottle then. And that's what I did. I bought this stuff and I put it in a sprayer bottle and I started doing it. And then I was like, wow. You know, because that solved my rusting problem and it solved my cleaning problem with steel. I never had a problem with aluminum because you see the you can take your your uh, acid solution mm -hmm. and you you basically rinse it with the Johnson sprayer and then you come with the hose and you spray it off yeah. and 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 that it takes it off basically all you're doing is cleaning the metal you want the metal as clean as possible dust free as possible and Dirt that's your free. last page with your, with your aluminum rims as soon as you do with the water you let it dry and nothing else after that except oven and powder. That's right. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I mean, you know, if, if, if you, if you set it, if you set your rim down, like on a towel or something, then you got to take the map gas to it. So, yeah. uh, but if you, if you have it suspended at that point from when you're cleaning it and you're not really touching it, you know, and that's another thing I, you know, I, my hands are generally always clean but you know, if you you know if, if you're not sure, wear gloves. You know, wear those the uh, cheapy gloves, uh, the blue ones like the doctors wear. But uh, uh, definitely, if you eat lunch or something, you got to wash your hands because it's amazing. You just touch something, and your thumbprint's in there. The oils and yeah, it's, usually not, it's usually not an issue to create a problem. But uh, you know, it depends. Uh, and some people don't aren't suited for this business. Uh, this is something we've really not talked about. Uh, it's uh, we're dealing with electronics basically, and uh, you, if you're not like connected to Saturn in some way, it, it ain't gonna work for you. <laughs> uh, I, that's the, you're probably going, what the fuck is this guy talking about? But uh, basically, if you're not a, 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 I, I had this one guy. He came in and he he worked for me for a, this is years back, and. He was like, he pulls the trigger to the gut and all the fucking powder landed on him and not on the part. And I'm like, what the hell is going on here? And I, you know, I was like looking for grounding issues and we couldn't figure it out. And he would just have powder on him all the time. Just like, like, gee, and I just, I just came to the conclusion that he was charged more than the gun, the part right. was. And, the, and, and the stuff was just sticking to him. And uh, obviously I'm a well-grounded person because if you look at the videos that I do, there's barely any, I don't even wear a mask. I just sit there and shoot it because, you know, it's all going on the part. But, you know, I've seen people, it's just like, they come out like, they, it's like, what are you doing? It's all, the powder is all on them and not on the- Aimed at you or what? Yeah. yeah. Well, Personally. you know, that's another thing, you know, you, you, you design, I design my own ovens. So uh, when I do a big railing, it, my railing is set the way I'm going to, you're going to look at it. Right. I powder coat the parts the way you're going to look at it. I don't put the railing in sideways and at a weird angle and, and powder coat underneath it because you'll have problems that way too. That's another big issue. So, I mean, there's, I can go on and on and on and on about all these issues and problems you can have, but uh, yeah, you got to be the right kind of person because uh, I've seen literally uh, people you know, they, they want a powder coat, but they can't get the stick and it just doesn't work for them. Okay. And that's not, and it's them. It is them. And it's like, they're just not the right person for it. And it's really weird. 
You know, what do you say to somebody like that? You know, it's just like, well, sorry, bro. You just can't do it. You know? And you, so yeah, that has to be the main thing. You gotta be, you, the machine's gotta like you. And, right. and once you have control of the machine and you're confident, then it's just like, it's game over. You can do, and you gotta have be confident. That's another big, when I train my guys, I, I, I tell them own that, own it, go in there and own it. It's an attitude because if you have like just a little bit of doubt, like, Oh, is it going to, Oh, it's probably going to reject or not stick here or, or I'm going to miss a spot. If you start thinking like that, you're, you're setting up for full failure. You're going to have it. It's like, you got to be like, yeah, I'm in control of this and let's go in there and code it, you know? Hey, look, we, we got a gun, you know, that's what we're doing all day. So, you know, act like a cowboy, you know, go in there and own that. So know that it's going to turn out good. Know that it's going to turn out good. Yep. Yep. Yeah. We're a little perfectionist side. My wife thinks I'm a, a perfectionist. Just if I, if I notice it, customer may not notice a bit, but I'll redo it. <clears throat> yeah. You know, I'm the same way. Uh, same way. Yeah, there's there's times though where you gotta you gotta let it slide though, because uh, yeah. you know it, it oh, becomes yeah. it becomes you'll just be at it all the time, and you know. Uh, but if it's obviously a, I mean, I've got some. Uh, what are these called? Fuel rims, Kim? Yeah. I mean, they're huge, and they came from the factory fuel. And I was looking at the powder coat job. It's sloppy, it's sloppy. I was like, oh my god, this came from the factory, and I'm like you know, I wouldn't have let these out my door. And I'm like, holy crap. You know, so the kid that's going to get these is going to get a, a, a just an amazing job. But uh, I, I was looking at what, a, you know, this is a so-called professional, you know, and I'm looking at the job. I mean, there's, there's, there's chunks of dirt in the powder coat finish. There's unevenness uh, on the facings. And uh, it's like, whoa, it's like, these need to be completely redone. But, uh, you know, and these rims are probably, uh, I don't know, they got to be like 500 bucks each. I don't know. Yeah, that's somebody that don't have pride in their work anymore. And that's an issue. Get well, it's, it's, a, it's a big factory, probably. I don't know. Who knows? So uh, it could be automated and automation. You don't catch those things. But I don't know how they could do these deep dish rims with the automated process. Do you think they powder coat at fuel? Or do you think he powder coated them somewhere else? I have no idea, uh, but anyways, uh, we're getting sidetracked yeah. here. So, do you want to let let's do the big reveal? I'll pull up the your rims and see how they turned out. See if anybody likes them. But you hold on. We'll just keep talking, guys. I'm gonna pull up my screen. <laughs> so yeah, it's uh, do, uh, BJ. Do you have any other questions? You uh, is there anything that you want to hit on that you? Uh, oh, like the hot blocking that. Makes sense, and I'm actually gonna try it. I'm gonna test it on my rims first. Uh, we have some <laughs> spares just to make sure that I have the, the the process down. And then some of those things that we've talked about with the steelies, you know, filling in that hole, I'm definitely gonna use just to make it look better because those were nightmares. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah so, I've done I, I've done the on those steel rims. I get a lot of uh, Chevelles and. Uh, uh, What's the other one? Charger and Challengers. So, so that older 66 to 72 range, they got those old steelies and the guys want them redone. And I've, I've filled them in with JB Weld and, and literally hand sanded those out. And uh, the, we got a picture of one I did like about five years ago. I don't know where it's at, but I'll show you what, it, if we can pull it up later on and it, it you'll just be like, Oh my God. Oh, that's my rim. So. That's the uh, uh, black label, murderous black. And oh, I, I tell you what, it, that is, you know, there's no clear coat on there. And that is one shiny rim. It is like over the top wet. It looks, it literally looks wet when you first walk up to it. You're like, oh my God, is that even dry? And uh, it's pretty amazing. So those are old pro comp rims. I'm kind of an old school guy. I don't like those big 20 inch rims. Uh, I prefer more of the 18 meat on my tire. I like meat, meat on my tire. <laughs> um, let me uh, stop and then I'll share another shot of the car, the truck. Well, actually, do we have that old, remember that Chevelle rim that we did? 
that was like about five, seven years ago. You remember? And I two-toned it. It had the black center. Yeah, that's this. on our website. Why? What? What? I mean, what are you talking about there? Well, it's just basically I filled it in with JB Weld, and I wanted to show. Oh, them well, but, that might but, take a little while to find. Yeah, but, yeah. but well, actually, it's on our website. You'll you'll know which room it is when you see it. And that's what filled with JB Weld, the same as uh, that you saw with the, the tank on the motorcycle. So you can use these things to fill in. And the lab metal, I've never used, but I'm sure it's the same thing. It's just a, a high temperature filler. It's basically that's all it is. And it, it just, it, the thing about these high temperature fillers is they're very hard to sand out. So you're, 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 you're in it for the love, the yeah. love of the job. Uh, you're not in it for, for, uh, you, I mean, that's the thing when I, that guy's tank, I mean, I spent five days on that tank and I was doing other jobs. So it was just like, I would work on it here and there. Uh, but you know, realistically, I, I think I would have to charge like a thousand bucks to do something like that. And, you know, I know the guy and he's a repeat customer and, you know, I only charge him 200 bucks to do that. That was, that's cheap. And, uh, you know, the hell, I think the materials were that much. The JB Weld is expensive, you know, and just like that lab metal stuff, I know it's expensive, but uh, yeah, you just gotta, sometimes it's about the love of it uh, and you, you want your customers happy and, and you gotta do things like that every now and then. Uh, try to minimize that as much as possible and make everything profitable. Um, keep your costs down. Uh, uh, I don't, do you run uh, gas uh, ovens? electric oven. Oh, there you go. Yeah. See, uh, I run electric ovens and a lot of guys, they think gas is the world and uh, gas is not what it's all cracked up to be. Uh, in fact, I recently had to expand one of my little ovens to fit a, a piece in. And I, I basically put in some infrared heat lamps to expand it and made it gas uh, for about a month. And as it was also to cure my curiosity on how much faster is it? And, and it, it is a little faster uh, as far as getting your oven up to temperature. Uh, I probably say I shaved off one batch cycle in a day by doing that, but that's not really that much really. And the cost is amazingly more. Uh, a tank of propane, this is uh, uh, one of those hundred pound tanks Yep. Here in Hawaii, that costs two hundred dollars to fill, and yes. you will if you got a big oven, you'll run that out in two days. So that's two hundred bucks. Bam, bam, bam. You know, it's just like, uh, -uh. my electric bill. You know, I did a uh, we uh, the busiest month I ever had. Uh, we did sixty thousand dollars, and I, our electric bill was what fifteen hundred bucks. Yeah, I mean, it was like 1200 or it wasn't yeah. even, yeah, maybe I think that was the highest we ever paid was like 1500 something like yeah. that. So, so, you know, I don't know what your electric rates are, but it's definitely, it's, uh, it's more feasible. It takes a little longer uh, to, to get the temperature up to tight, you know, but. Uh, air yourself. Yeah, but once you're there, you're good. So, you know, it's just a matter of getting up a little earlier. Uh, that's usually the first thing I do when I know I have a busy day. If I'm running the big oven, I the first, oh, any oven, I just basically, as I walk through the door, like seven o'clock, I that's the first thing I do. I fire up the ovens, boom. And uh, cause I let them get up to temperature, you know? And by the time you have a cup of coffee and get around to getting something done, they're ready to go. So, uh, you know, it, it is, it, you get a really good uniform cook with the electric ovens. Uh, gas ovens, uh, most of them are, well, I don't know what type of ele electric oven you have, but most of them are convection, so they circulate the air through it. Uh, and you have to be careful with those because you get hot spots and cold spots in the oven. Uh, uh, where the ovens I've designed, uh, it, it's I basically have put the uh, elements all at the base of the oven around the bottom, and the heat just rises, and you get a nice, perfect cook every time. And I've never had any issues, so, and, you don't, because I don't have air flowing around in oh, the oven, I don't, I don't got crap in, going in my jobs. I mean, so uh, these are things that the uh, industry, you have to, uh, you know, expect. I'm, I'm always getting comments on uh, 
when somebody's on my YouTube uh, video, they'll see what kind of oven and be like, well, you should convert to gas oven and stuff. It's like, why? Like, I've never had any issue with my oven. Like, I'll keep what I'm doing. It seems to work. No, it's the way to go. Electric is really, it is superior because it is more uniform in the cook and you have total control over that. Uh, gas, you don't, and it's dirty. Uh, propane, now if you're using natural gas, that's a lot cleaner, but propane okay. is super dirty. And you, you can literally, you'll have like water running down in the inside of your oven walls. It's, and that can get in your job, it's horrible. Uh, these are, you know, they don't talk about this stuff, but uh, it's a big issue. And uh, propane well, for is- the, in, the industrialists, all they want is the bottom line is their margins, right? So that, yeah. you know, it but, just uh, so yeah. happened that it's expensive here for gas or propane. So that's why we opt- opted for something else. Yeah, when, and you know, you can put a solar array, a PV up on your roof and next thing you know, you know, you're, you know, especially here in Hawaii, your operational cost goes to zero. There's zero is, point. You know, you're, 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 you know. Or that's granted, our dream. That's our dream is to have a building that's zero point, you know. See, and that's one of the things with powder coating that interests me. Like, I try to have it in my descriptions and I try to always say to people, if you see me doing one thing, you see somebody else doing a different thing, you know, don't bash on each other. As long as a product turns out, everybody learns a different way. Everybody has different methods. And just because somebody's not doing the same as I'm doing, doesn't mean they're doing it wrong. Doesn't mean I'm doing it right. Um, so like, I try to push out some in my videos, if you've seen them, uh, just because there's a lot of negativity around, I don't know, just YouTube in general with things like this. Uh, so it's just like if the product turns out right in the end, they did they did something right. Absolutely correct. Uh, the the school of hard knocks uh, will teach you much more than somebody saying this is the way to do it, and you should you should you should do it the way I tell you to do it because I know what I'm doing. Uh uh-uh. you know, like for example, you know, I'm not a professional. I mean, I mean, I'm a professional in the fact that I charge money. But, you know, if, if you can find a better way to do something, do it. Yep. And, you know, and that's why I've, I'm just sharing what I've learned and it works for me. And chances are it will work for you and you'll be like, oh, this is great. Uh, but if it doesn't, you know, just uh, use what you like to do. Uh, everybody has their ways. And uh, the, the most important thing that I can say is be the guy in your area, and uh, yep. once you once you become <laughs> that guy, you it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what these YouTuber guys say. I mean, I mean, some of them are just out to lunch, and it doesn't matter. So, just, oh, oh just, boy, here we go. Watch out. Just, just we know who you're talking about. Just you know, <laughs> just just be the guy, and and everything else falls in place. And yeah, don't yeah. stop learning. Like, don't stop learning. Yes. And don't yeah. stop learning. And I mean, I'm always, uh, I had two days off uh, this week uh, after I did my rims and I worked on my own finishes and I did some neat stuff. And, you know, it's uh, it, it's really important to, to always expand your horizons, uh, especially in the direction you want to go. Um, and sometimes uh, uh, peop- you get challenged to do things that you don't want to do. And, you know, like that tank, you know, with the JV weld, I really don't like doing that stuff. It's just like, Oh God. But you know, the, the customer challenged me. He was a repeat, repeat customer. I wanted to make him happy. And uh, that's what happened. Made him happy. So. And well, I think have finding, that, yeah. Go. Sorry, Ross, but just knowing who you are as a powder coater and who your customer is, is a way it, it's like, sometimes there's times where we're, we're actually saying no, more often than we ever have before. Yes, we have. And that's a good thing to say no, because you're basically saying, this is my parameters of who I want to do business with. Um, I, I just hate doing lanai furniture. I just, I just it repulses me. I just, I, I can't even look at it. And I see some chairs hanging in the back there. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I, I just like, take that thing down. It's making me angry. 
Well, that's my wife's mother's chair. So, oh, okay, okay, okay. 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 all right, all right. Sure. Restoration. <laughs> Christmas present. Um, but yeah, you, you know, and it's funny because here we are in the heart of Hawaii. There is no shortage of lanai furniture or patio furniture, if you guys call it on the mainland. We call it lanai furniture. There's no shortage of it here. But no, actually, that, I, that was what you're doing that. that yeah, yeah. And that was uh, one of his questions here. He says, uh, I can't remember, but. Uh, you work with other powder coaters in the area. And the, the answer to that question is yes, I do. Uh, I don't actually physically work with them, but uh, I will send all my the Lanai furniture stuff to that guy because that's what he does. And that's his business model. And, and it's not mine. And he, he's set up for that. And he, does a, he has a box feed and he literally, it's like if you went to him with a rim, he, he would just look at you like, what? I got to change my color, you know? Because it's like, he, he just runs like tan all month long, you know? And it's like, I got to change my color. Uh, well, you're going to have to wait until I do black. That's like three months from now. And, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm over. I know. It's <laughs> but, you know, and, but it, so that's why I'm here. Because those people come right down and they go, hey, can you do this rim in black? I'm like, yeah, man, put them right here, you know? But the, the lady with the, once the tan furniture, I go, no, take it to the guy down the street. And it works great. We have a great symbiotic relationship that way. I mean, uh, I, I've, I've really never met him, but, uh, you know, it's like, I don't bad mouth him. And I'm, I don't think he bad mouths me, you know. Yeah, you, kind of, you kind of work together. And the reason I asked you that is because uh, uh, Darby's coding. Uh, he's in a few towns over, like 30 minutes away from me. Um, like he gave me a call and needed to use my rim strip, came down, stripped his rims, having an issue with one of his rims, couldn't figure it out. So uh, we powder coated it together. And I actually did one of my YouTube videos on it, but we powder coated it together as in, you know, helping out. He's a competitor of mine. Um, but usually when I have people ask me, can you do it? And I'm like, I'm a month out at this point. Um, I always suggest him over the, the bigger ones, you know, just as, you know, an up and comer, you know, try to help him out too. Uh, that's right. kind of why I asked that to see if you kind of did that same thing or if you're like other people that are like, no, competitor. I'm, I, 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 there's a little bit of no, in, <laughs> there is a little bit of no in me, but uh, there, I do help out the uh, smaller guys. Like uh, there's a guy we just sold a whole bunch of, uh, before, when we could sell it, we were selling uh, Benko to him. Um, uh, now because of the rules that's changed, we had to stop doing Jay, that. But, from make but, uh, any kind, go follow him. Yeah, great, great guy. Does all kinds of stuff and just small stuff. He and, does Yeti mugs. He, he doesn't just do powder coating. He makes all kinds of art, pro you know, like, company like he he'll do engraving and you know he does all kinds of little stuff That's i think he does hy hydro dipping too so weird okay. stuff so. you know so anyways uh you know and he buys media from me uh the garnet because it's so expensive to go through other people so uh you know those those yeah i do have relationships with other coders and i i try to help them out in that way but, you know, I, I got to be up front. This is the most information I've ever given out. It was just today. And, you know, I, I usually don't really, I'm kind of secretive about stuff like this about, because, you know, it took me a long time to learn how to, to do it right. And I pride myself and I know this and, and I just let that out of the back today. You guys got the holy grail of how I do my ribs. Well, I'll tell you, for me and my subscribers, I definitely appreciate it and want to thank you for <laughs> That because it is, it's an eye opener and it's something that I know a lot of my subscribers, they, they feel the same way. Like it's been a taboo and like, if it can help us and we're able to do our work in a better quality and just learn in a different way. I mean, that's what we're basically, that's why we learn. So yeah. definitely. That. Well, I, I, I think in a nutshell, uh, the, the hot flocking is, is, it is, a way to cut costs because you're doing two coats in one sitting. Um, you're going to get more perfect results. Granted, if you don't have crap flying into it, um, you should nail it out the park every time. Um, other than that, 
Uh, use any other method you think is good. But I use this method 99% of the time on everything I do because I always pre-cook my stuff. I, it's just part of the process I do. I like to preheat because I deal with a lot of aluminum and aluminum is a soft metal. And if you don't get it up to temperature and it, you can have outgassing issues or, or very issues in the way the, the finish looks on the way the metal sweated as it's heating up. So uh, it's very important to, to heat the metal up and do that. And, and hot flocking solves all of these problems. And you can get two coats, like I said, in one shot and you're off to the races and you're done at the end of the day. And I turn a lot of stuff over in a day just by myself. And, you know, I try to blast uh, three days a week and I powder coat two days a week. You know, so I spend more time blasting and stripping than I do powder coating. So uh, it, it's a bummer, you know, I, I but that's, it, that's the way <laughs> I guess, it is. Uh, I guess I'm like, honey, you have to learn how to do this because I just don't want to do it no more. I I just Boston sucks. Hey, so I got a double edged question for you, which is kind of probably might be a hard one to answer. Um, things that you see on YouTube that other YouTubers do don't have to do no names or anything. Is there things out there that you see are done on social media dealing with powder coating that you're like, are you fucking serious? Like blow my mind that is so wrong and so stupid I, I don't know the right way to say it um just like you see somebody doing a rim and they wipe it down with vegetable oil i i don't know just like anything out there that you see like you're just like that's fucking nuts i can't well, believe anybody this I, I i'll be up front with you i stopped watching youtube after i learned to build my oven Oh, and it was just like, because there was no reason. I, it's like, okay, I, I'm better than everybody else on YouTube. I learned my so lesson. <laughs> I, I'm done and I don't want to watch other people. And, and I, I really, you know, Kim is the, you, she, she basically runs through and meets people and, and, and she'll say, what do you think about this? And I go, well, let me see it, you know? And, and then she'll show me it. And I'll, I, sometimes I just go, what? No. You don't want that guy on the show. <laughs> Those other ones, I know she, I'm always seeing her comments in there. Um, that's why I figured she must have some kind of insight on, she must be like, hun, does it like, make sense? Uh, um, and that's just pretty much what I was asking. Yeah, no, you, you're, you're pretty much right. Uh, she's my filter. She'll, she'll basically, uh, uh, it works both ways because I, I just, you know, I don't put up with any shit, period. Right. You know, it's just like, are you kidding me? And I'll just, you know, but so, you know, it's like, she'll be like, oh, you can't say that, honey. You know, and it's like, oh, OK, well, you know, you do that. So, you know, that's why I really I don't do these podcasts much uh, because, uh, you know, A, I'm busy, uh, but but B is uh, my filter will come off and I and I have to keep it on. But, you know, the there's people out there doing stuff wrong and there's people stabbing each other in the back. There's people that want to make money at this just strictly, you know, as a YouTube sensation. And, uh, I, you know, I just do this because the people in my area, I service their needs. And I'm you looking at this YouTube stuff and going, wow, you know, we'll just put our stuff up and look at it. And it is what it is. You know, I, I am no king of two toning rims. I, I, I don't really like doing that. I already told you that I know how to do that, but it's just the, it, I've run the math to me is like, you got to charge so much money to really make it profitable, you know? So I, I just like, Oh, I kind of lean, I take the customer and I hold his hand and I say, you know, why don't we do it this way? It will look really nice and it won't cost you that much money. And then they go, you know what? You're right. And then, I, and then that way I can stay in my comfort zone and, you know, give well, the customer. You no. Know, okay. So, but the, the area has to lend itself to that. So, you know, um, most of our customers 
they just want their BMW rims or their Mercedes rims or their to Toyota Taco Tacoma rims done in black. You know, it's just the or nature silver. of the people around us or silver. Yeah, exactly. And that's who we're catering to. If you want to go and ignore, if we, you know, like we're not going to go and get a bunch of two-tone rims. It's just not indicative of our area. We've got guys that like lifted trucks. Um, we've got guys that, you know, will have some money to do this and that. But for the majority of the stuff we're doing automotive, it's uh, pretty much basic stuff. And I, I suspect it's that way for mo most people, unless you're living or catering to an Instagrammer, uh, influencer or you're doing something for SEMA or whatever, you know, you're going to, you're either going to cater to those people or you're going to cater to the everyday guy. Personally, I bank on the everyday guy because there are mu may, way more of those people than there are of the SEMA builder type, you know, people. And, that's what you you need to think of that way when you're doing stuff like that you know yeah yeah no totally so you guys so you guys do a lot of black like i do um Lots one question i get from uh, a lot of people is when they're doing glossy black they're dealing with a lot of uh micro scratches and stuff like that i don't see that so much in mine so i really don't know how to answer yeah them. i saw uh, that on the groups yeah so, I mean, do you guys have any idea what it might be and for an, a suggestion on what they may be doing wrong or what they should try so their their black glossy black rims won't be so micro scratched, I guess is the right word to say? You know, that's bizarre. I don't have that problem either. Uh, so it's obviously it's something that they're not doing that we are doing, you know, so... Uh, I probably say it would have to be like they're not sandblasting or something. I don't know. Uh, uh, no, I mean, he's talking about the powder and the, the the nature of the powder after it's cured. A lot of people are reporting that there's um, some small kind of scratching. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like 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 like, pit, like bubbles or scratching. No, if you take your hand. You could take your hand and rub your hand on it, and then you got like micro scratches in it. Uh, wow. Or, towel or a paper towel and they're just micro scratches in it kind of like you, on a normal paint job right uh it's i i have no idea what's causing that but uh it sounds like to me that it's definitely in the pre preparation of the rim you know uh and and maybe they're not i don't know are they you know who knows they could be wiping yeah. it down with the alcohol i don't know no uh, no what he's talking about is ashton and i were talking about different kinds of powder and one of the things, uh, the the Malbec Illusion Malbec from oh Christianic. yes yes remember I know how that. easy it was to scratch it. Uh, it no, what happened is the uh, uh, it bleeds it bleeds through the other coats because uh, you have to put a, a clear coat over the Illusion Malbec, and I was having bleeding through the clear coat, and I was like, what the hell is this? Because I I was like. I had a, I remember I had an imperfection. I was sanding it out and I was like, it was all red. And I'm like, well, this is gloss clear. Why is it red? And, and then I realized that's what the problem was. It was bleeding through. And that's what was creating that. It looked like, like pin bubbles almost. You, you wouldn't notice it unless you really saw it. And, uh, but I fixed it by doing three layers of clear coat. That's how I fixed that. And so now somebody wants Malbec, they come into my shop, I go, oh, that's going to be expensive. And they go, why? And I go, because I got to go over it three times with clear coat to make it look like that picture you want. Because now what stage was the, was the clear coat put on? Was it put on after flow out or was it cured to a certain point before the... Oh, I did. I, I uh, basically had the, uh, the, uh, the Malbec is a base coat, if I remember yeah. correctly. It's like... Uh, it's kind of like a dormant, if I remember correctly. Yeah, you, I put that on, and you got to. I did not a full cure, but I did like a, a ten minute cure at like three eighty, uh, and because uh, I knew it was like you got to be careful with anything that has like a silvery tint to it. Anything that has a silvery tint, you it's like you should benefit of the doubt, cure it because 
and it, I've learned this with uh, uh, the Ultra Chrome from Prismatic. Uh, there's mm. some, there's uh, even Argent Silver. If you don't cure that fully, like it's a chrome coat, you can have uh, issues with the uh, clear coat, uh, mm. with wrinkling, like miniature, like these bubbles I'm talking about, uh, and, and bleed through. So, uh, uh, and bleed through, uh, you can have a lot of problems with the chrome. Oh my God. So uh, I usually, anything that has like a silvery tint to it, I, I cook the shit out of it. And then I, I do the clear coat. Uh, but that Malbec, I didn't matter what, how long I cured it for, it just needed, it needed three layers of clear to make it look right. And I'll never forget, because I did that guy's motorcycle tank in that, and I did his fenders. And, and, and those are, those are like, you, that's the eyepiece of the motorcycle. Right. So, and I, I just was like, oh my God, I just kept layering Uncle it. Uncle Billy. Layering. Uncle, Uncle Billy. Billy. <laughs> right. He's the ni- he is the nicest guy. Oh my God. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So, if you're, so curing, if you're curing these silver layers, are you having any bonding issues with your- nah. Oh. I've never had never had any bonding issues. Uh, once you uh, heat it up, it, you know the powder is soft, mm-hmm. and and then your next coat. That's why hot flocking is really the way to go because every every coat that you do, the the piece is is warm and hot and it's soft and pliable. So the next coat is actually melding right onto it. Uh, so it's even not if you're like, not hot flocking the next coat, you're still putting it on kind of warm. Always, yes, anyway, yeah. I never do any, like I told you, I very rarely do anything straight cold. It's always pre-cooked and then I bring it out. I might let it sit for a minute and cool down and then and then do a full color coat on it or whatever I'm doing, you know, primer coat. But I never do it straight cold. And uh, the main reason for that is the sweating of the metal because you're gonna put that in the oven, that metal is gonna heat up. And as it does that, it makes water as it sweats and that's going to go into your finish. So uh, very, very important. Uh, that's why uh, like little parts, if you want to avoid doing that, you can just take your map gas. Uh, let's say it's like a sprocket or something like that, of small size, some handlebars. You can literally take your map gas, hit the metal and you can watch it heat up as the, as you can literally see the water flow out as you're running your, you start at the bottom and work your way up and you can see the water just flow right out of the metal and all the way to the top. And once you sweat that metal out, you're ready. Right. You're good. You're good to uh, powder coat. A lot of guys don't know about that. Very important to uh, de-sweat your metal. No, and I, I've never heard of that, but it makes sense. Something's cold. You turn it hot, that temperature change. What happens? It's moisture. Yeah, yeah, and and obviously, where uh, the colder the temperature, the more of the changes. So you can have a, a more dynamic. I mean, wh- what is it? Forty degrees where you're at right now? Yep. yep. Yeah. Much. So, I mean, that's uh, forty to four hundred is is a big change. So change. <laughs> good yep. to preheat the, preheat the stuff. And uh, you know, I that's why I probably don't I don't run into stuff much. But uh, the black don't have I I don't know what that is. Um, I use a uh, tiger dry lock wet black. That's my favorite uh, black to use. Uh, I just used the murderous black that was beautiful, uh, but he recommends a two coat to do that. And uh, generally, you know, I'm not going to do that for, for everybody. Literally like put down a coat, cure it, and then put on another coat or uh, flow out and then put on a second coat. Put, on, put a coat on, flow it out, and then, you know, let it, you know, not full cure, but just let it flow out and then bring it out and do the same thing over again. Yeah. Never heard of that one. I got a customer. I got to go. <laughs> so thank you. Yeah. Uh, you guys uh, take care. And if you have any other questions, uh, please uh, contact us through the email. I'll be happy to, to respond. If you guys want another video of anything, uh, let us know, uh, look up that hold tight. I'm telling you it will, it's a game changer. Uh, all these things we talked about uh, with the silicone and the JB weld, you can try those out. If you're doing black, it's a no-brainer. Just come in after the fact and, and silicone up those areas, and that way the salt can't get in there and it's sealed. The customer can't see it. You won't notice it. Only you will know it's there. And uh, But let them know you're doing it, though. And uh, other than that, uh, 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 guys, Merry Christmas. 
Merry Thank Christmas. You. Thank you for your time. I appreciate the information that you gave us. You're welcome. And uh, uh, consider it uh, not sacred knowledge, but uh, yeah, that guy knows what he's talking about. Yeah. All right, I'll talk to you later. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs>